So I know what you're expecting from Skepton. Something. Hear it? Yeah, that's it. Something with a slow start. That's it. The pulse. Straight from the heart. So I know what you're expecting. People, I give you Michael, Venom, Page. I give you MVP. I give you MMA. I give you Bellator. Fighting out of London, England with a record of 20 fights and 19 wins and only one defeat. And that defeat means that this night is revenge night. Because on this night of all nights, MVP faces the fighter, the only fighter to have beaten me. Douglas Lima. Three times a world champion, and the last time was a no doubt. Stand in front of this guy, and he'll turn the lights out. But for London, for me, the long wait is over. And this time, it's my time. A new world, ready for a new world order. So, what are you expecting? Don't go into the cage if you're not ready to fight. If you're not ready for a fight. And tonight is fight night. Tonight is fight. It has been all of 678 days since Bellator lit up the English capital. And finally, we are back in London with the world's best MMA fighters who are primed and ready to go inside a soon-to-be-packed SSE Arena Wembley. We have a thrilling night of combat that will culminate in a monumental welterweight clash that will have huge consequences for the division. A highly important and hugely anticipated rematch takes center stage as we run it back between the top two contenders at 170 pounds. The former three-time division champion, Douglas the Phenom Lima, steps in once again with the electric and deadly Michael Page. Venom is out for redemption against the only man to defeat him as a professional mixed martial artist, while Lima wants to reassert himself right back into title contention. But will it be repeat or revenge? Well, that question will be answered before the night is through. Hello and welcome. It is so good to be back. I'm Aidan Power, and all the better to be joined in the company of the former two-time champion, Josh Th Thompson. And I suspect wild horses, jet lag, and even having to work with me for the next five and a half hours wouldn't have stopped you being here tonight. I have missed working with you. We haven't worked together since last February, pre-COVID. I'm so excited to see you, my friend. It's been a long time. I can't wait to work with you tonight. Let's see if that's where the pleasantries uh, end for the evening. Right, let's get straight to it and rerun the fun from the first dance before these uh, before these two legends uh, and before this ending sequence. Up until that point, who had the advantage, JT? MVP. He was dictating the pace of the fight. He was controlling every aspect of that fight. Up until that very moment, Douglas Lima was waiting. He was waiting for his chance. He was waiting for his shot. He got it. Will he get it tonight? I don't know. That's the question, MVP, of course admit it, uh, it was that one mistake but since then it was a blip he's got right back on it and he's continued to do what he is famous for and that is deliver spectacular 1k knockouts yeah that's what he knockout. that's what he is known for he is known by stepping in waiting for the counter and when you go when you step forward trying to land your hard shot he steps in with speed reach range and precision and he lands right on the button he makes like big john mccarthy says all the time he makes the top fighters in the world look bad because that's how good he is just that night when he fought lima lima had his number guess what this is a different night and he's been on a rampage since then he's going to show the world that he's ready that that fight was a was a fluke and he's ready right now to move on to the title shot. he's waited a long time to get this rematch we see big john mccarthy there for one of those knockouts we'll see big john mccarthy very shortly Let's tell you now what we have here tonight. It is an epic rematch that headlines our Fight Fight main card here at Bellator 267. You can see it on Showtime at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 1 p.m. Pacific.
Pacific. Now in our co-main event, Northern Ireland's Leah McCourt aims to continue her unblemished blemished streak as a Bellator featherweight against Florida's Jessica Borga. In the three spot, it's an exciting men's featherweight matchup between the veterans Robert Whiteford and Andrew Fisher. Josh Thompson is tipping that to be fight of the night, potentially. Before that, though, we have the English pair, Blue Trainer and Yannick Bahadi. They're set to collide at 2.05, and we kick it all off with an explosive lightweight matchup between the very experienced Tim Wilde and the very acrobatic Eve Lanju. Well, between now and then, here live on the Bellator YouTube channel and indeed the BBC iPlayer, we bring you top talent and prospects from across the Bellator roster in our prelims. So let's get underway and say good evening to Sean Grandy. All right, Aiden, thank you so much. Just alongside John McCarthy, I'm glad Josh made it through customs. His razor didn't. <laughs> I was no. surprised they got He's that got from that him. new scruff look. All right, we're going to see, we're talking about prospects. Uh, if you haven't seen Korshad Kakarov yet, uh, keep your eye on this young man. He is explosive, very heavy handed for the weight class. He's got a lot of power and he relies on that power. Doesn't throw a lot of volume, but boy, when he wants to explode, he does. All right, let's check out. Let's check out the tail of the tape. Our tail of the tape for this Bantamweight matchup. Take a look at the reach advantage that Junior Jair has. That is a big one. That's six inches. Can he keep this man to the outside and pick him apart? It's not Bellator MMA without Michael C. Williams to begin it. Bellator MMA back in London, England tonight from the SSC Arena, Wembley. We welcome all of those joining us live in the UK on BBC iPlayer as we are set now to begin the Bellator 267 prelims with three five-minute rounds in the bantamweight division. Introducing the blue corner at 5'10", weighing in 136 pounds. His professional record, seven wins, two losses from Curitiba, Bahana, Brazil, presenting Jair, JJ Jr. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at 5'8", weighing in 134.8 pounds as a professional. He's undefeated, seven victories, no defeats, fighting out of Tajikistan, Koshed, Killer Kokoro. In charge of the action, your referee, Jaron Bilal. Always important. I'm surprised more guys don't do that. Like, are we gonna do the? Are we touching fists or not? Because I'm not gonna do it. You're not gonna do it. I love the fact that Junior told the camera, "Yeah, hey, get out." Yeah, it's, it's time. I've been here long enough. One of the topics we'll be covering throughout a lot of these prelims, in particular, but it's going to, going to go into the main card as well, is the layoff because a lot of these fighters have not fought since before COVID. You're right, a lot of these fighters are under contract with Bellator. They have been sitting on the sidelines based upon COVID, not being able to get a visa, not being able to get out of their country. So we're going to see a whole lot of people that are excited to be in the cage tonight. Jair Jr. wants this on the floor, as you would expect. His wins have come by submission. He is a BJJ player. Coming out of Curitiba, Brazil, there's a ton of strikers. Anderson Silva, Vanderlei Silva, the Hua brothers, a bunch of guys that are phenomenal strikers. He's a good striker, but he knows that his skill set and advantage is on the ground. So you heard Michael C. Williams say Tajikistan, which you may not have heard of. I've been dying, I've literally been waiting and I didn't ask you for the last two days of hanging around. Tell me you, this, you can't have been there. I have not been to Tajikistan. I knew it. We finally got one on the box we can check off. Do you know where it is? I do. I've been near it. Been next North to it. Afghanistan is to the south of it. China. Yep. Uzbekistan. I've been to Uzbekistan. All right. This isn't, you know, it's not a contest. <laughs> but if it were one, you would win. A nice, you know, very nice right now as far as you're looking at this clinch position. Very strong position as far as keeping the elbows up high for Kakarov. He is very strong, and that's the one difference you'll see with his opponents. He tends to just start to overpower his opponents. And an easy way to think about what you're saying is we know what Jair Jr. wants to do in this fight and where he wants, and he hasn't been able to get him even close to where he wants. But he, the one thing he is doing is 
by being in this clinch position, he's not accepting a lot of damage. He's not being hurt by the power. And so right now, he's being smart. Let me wear on these arms. Let these arms get heavy. They're not gonna have as much snap on those punches. Kokorov, five straight knockouts. On route to this 7-0 start. So the three-year layoff for Jair Jr. He hasn't lost a fight in over five and a half years. Still looking for that outside trip now. And that's what, you don't have it, that's what can happen. But again, not right. terrible right. in the position that he was wanting to be in this fight. He would rather have been in the top position. But, but if it, that head comes out. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Nice job of breaking yep. the posture, though. If only someone in Ric Flair's camp had realized the thought to try to get that because where he could get like five cents for every time. Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. Would never have had to wrestle again. Nice job moving that position. That's good hip movement. Junior doing a nice job, but unable to control that arm that he was actually needing to have in place so he could go for that arm bar. You can see how he definitely got Kokorov off of base and balance in his position, throwing him off. Kokorov coming right back on him. We talk all the time about the UK fighters being behind, say, the Americans when it comes to wrestling. Uh, the Eastern European fighters started to close the jiu-jitsu gap with fighters from Brazil or really in other parts of the world. Yeah, they just do it differently. And it's not, you know, when you're, when you're talking about their, their grappling compared to a Brazilian jiu-jitsu stylist grappling, it's different. They're getting their grappling more from wrestling and sambo, and there is a difference to that style. But all styles have the submission. They Some have more control base, some have more technique and getting that ending with that submission. If you're Cockroach here, do you step away and make him get up because you'd rather have the last minute? I'd look and say, look, you've always said this is you, you want to be knocking people out and you've proved that you can do it. Why am I going to sit here and play? I'm going to step back, make this man get up. You're the one that controls the position. You step back, the referee's going to make him get to his feet. You have your opportunity to get your knockouts. Particularly in a close round where there hasn't been a lot of things to choose from. As you always told me, you don't score points on defense. Defense does not score you anything. Right now, I think Cockroach understands that he's landed the better overall shots. He's been in better positions, so he's feeling comfortable with the round. He needs to be very careful of his leg right now. It's not straight, so there's no danger. One more shot before the bell. There are so many elements to the main event tonight as we build up in the hours leading up to it. The hometown element is a big part of the story. I've always thought that can come with a downside as well. Now, MVP is not the kind of guy that gets bothered by extra interview requests or whatever, but anyone who's ever had to do anything at home with ticket requests and your friends being around or whatever, there it can be another side to that coin. Absolutely, there's a ton of pressure that comes from being in front of your hometown crowd, being the guy that is expected to prove to these people how good you are. Douglas Lima comes into this, look, he's fought everywhere, and yes, it's the hometown of MVP, but the pressure is on MVP. Plenty of those fights coming up in Bellator. James Gallagher fighting in Dublin, Ryan Bader in Phoenix, and the, the mother of all homecomings in Moscow for Fedor on October 23rd. Nice distance control by Junior. It's good to want. Well, you know, everything is not about getting exactly where you want to be right, right away, and it is about getting that position. Now, he had double unders. Now he's lost that. He's not the guy in control of this position at this moment. It might be the most subtle and overlooked thing in this sport. The difference, John, explain the difference between exactly what you're looking at there. That's an under. 
on the right side of your screen is not. That is a monumental difference. It's almost hard to explain. Monumental difference in leverage you're talking about. With that underhook, you are able to leverage your opponent into positions in the cage by being able to bring them a little bit light, and they're not as strong. When you talk about that overhook, sometimes the overhook's a great tool. It's a great tool with the wizard and getting on position. But overall, you're looking for those underhooks, just like you saw Kakarov have. Shot, and this is where it ended up in the first round. Yeah, but what Junior is showing you is, look, I do not want to be in a slug, slugging competition with Kakarov. He's got too much power. I had opportunities in the first round. I think I can get there. He went for the leg lock. He went for the knee bar. It wasn't quite, not enough time, not enough position. But it only takes one mistake from Kakarov to give Junior that ability to lock on that submission. Now, we talked about Tajikistan, where he is from. He has been training in Germany, fighting out of Germany for the last couple of years, training with, speaking of guys coming up, Daniel Weichel, who fight Pedro Carvalho in Dublin. Nice heavy elbow. Another. That's what I thought he would do late in the first round. And you see it motioning, <laughs> telling him to get back to your feet. And Johnny Jr. was like, no, no, come on back to And that's the difference. When we talk about fight IQ, yeah. you'll get a lot of fighters that will end up fighting their opponent's fight. This is exactly what you want to see out of your fighter. I want you to be smart in there. You don't have to win every second of the match. You just have to be the person that is controlling it, landing the better shots, and being the person that says exactly where it's going to take place. Again, use that underhook to whip him around. Jair is just not able to get that physical positioning against Kakarov here. He's having problems when he gets into the clinch. He's losing the position right away. He took a good shot there. Right hook shot too, though. He did. First clean land, but he knows. You can see from the look on his face, his body language, that suddenly this is not where he wants to be. And, but you're also, and one of the things, pick up, watch him. He's ducking his head forward, and if Kogroff gets the idea of to bring a knee up at that time, it's going to be all over. Or, <laughs> or, <laughs> or I'll meet that head with my yeah. foot. I'll find your head wherever it is. Body kick. Everything's a step slower now. You can see. Jerry Jr. is breathing heavier. You see the mouth is open. Body positioning is telling you he's just not sure of what to do at this point. Nice heavy right hand. He's setting it up, left jab, setting up both of those right hands. Karov doesn't, he does not feel threatened, you can tell by the strike. No, and that's exactly what, what you're saying is the, the respect of his power yeah. is not there. Stalking him. But a lot of a lot of base hit mistakes right there. You and saw Kakarov going straight back multiple times. Finally, then he circles out with lateral movement. Through two. Here, there's the right hand being thrown by Jair, but doesn't land, just skims across, doesn't have the power, doesn't have that effect of making his opponent respect what he's doing. There's that hand again, but the but the left hook does land. And you see the response. 
Watch the left hook. Bip. Yep. Right along the ear. That's a shot that can absolutely affect your balance, but here comes the head kick afterwards by Kakarov going after him high. You can see he brought the hand up, but it does touch, but doesn't have a ton of power to hurt him. Of the thousands of times you've been in there, can you feel the moment when a fighter, I don't want to say loses respect for his opponent's power, but doesn't feel as threatened? There's almost a body language moment. You can see the moments when, when a fighter finally says, oh, you can't hurt me. You've hit me with your best shots. It's not enough to hurt me, and now I'm just going to start walking you down. See right there, that's a big wind up by Kakarov. Yeah. You know, his effective strikes have been the, the quick, the combinations, not one at a time. Yeah, and instead of winding up, the small shots that lead to big shots are the ones that end up hurting your opponent. You don't have to throw everything into the shot, but straight shots that make Jair bring his hands up, bring his hands down, and then you come to that open area, that's what makes you effective. The lower the output, the lower the volume, the less you're giving him to think about. Absolutely. And right now, it's even getting harder for Jerrier at this point to hold on based upon just both guys being a little sweatier, slipperier. And you can just see physically, there's no doubt that Kakarov is just the stronger fighter. Now you see the circling more. That? No. Yeah, it didn't do much. He was leaning the wrong way. But the one thing that Kakarov is really doing that is giving Jair the ability to stay with him. For the most part, he's only landing once. Watch one. He'll throw one, and he'll back off. He'll throw one, he'll back off. At one point, he threw a combination. But it's not the one twos, it's the one, two, three, fours that are going to get you where you need to get. At least you see yeah. Junior going after him with multiples. That gives him more opportunity to be successful. Almost caught the foot and any desperate attempt now for Jair Jr. to get him to the ground. He's trying to seize it again. One underhook. And not even that. There hasn't been a point in this fight where you really saw Jr. being the guy in control of the clinch. Kakarov has been the guy that's been able to control his position, put the fight where he wants, exit the clinch if he wants, stay with it. Which he just did. Eventually, these leg kicks are going to well, start paying dividends. He put one in the bank in round two that you could tell changed things up a little bit. You can tell. Let's just take a look at the limping step of Jair Jr. right now. He has got a compromised left leg. And Kakarov should go right back to it. There you go. Yep. He's got a minute left to keep a knockout streak going. Again, he has moved him in that spot the entire fight. Physically just much yeah. stronger, able to hold position. Nice heavy body shot. At this point in minute 15, Kakarov looks like he just woke up from a nap, where you can tell Jair Jr. has been in a fight. Yeah. He 
and you can see just as he gets out of the way that but there was so much weight on that leg that it's damaged now and he's having a hard time balancing himself oh, he's right on the top of the head Beautiful there's the knee you wanted final seconds the car oh. Oh, he took a shot he took a big oh. left hand and backed him up in the final seconds but they'll both end up on their feet Good stuff. That's what a three-year layoff looks like. <laughs> It, it is so much different, just the timing, the speed in a real fight compared to sparring and everything. They both really performed well. Let's take a look at what happened right near the end of this fight. Left hook opportunity, but the right hand hits right behind the ear. You can see his legs go a little bit stanky there. Tries to control his balance. He's able to by the use of the fence. Flying knee comes in, still hurt. Lands the right, but then that shot right there comes back and hurts Gagarov and hits him again. Both of them a little stunned. Both of them saying, oh, let's go. Nice finish by both fighters. Jair Jr.'s best shots of the fight came with him in big trouble in the final seconds. Any scenario by which Shayer Jr. won any of these rounds? Not, not in my view, but you never know. <laughs> Sometimes with judging, but that was, yeah. that was what's called a leading question. It Michael was. C. Williams has the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side, where all three, Michael Murtha, Doug Crosby, Eric Colon, all seed exactly the same 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision and still undefeated Koshed Killer Kokoro. He had to work, another learning opportunity, but more steps forward for a young undefeated fighter. Guys. Thanks, John. All right, one in the books. Now we're going to look ahead to our co-main event tonight in the female featherweight division between the number five ranked Leah McCourt, who will face Jessica Borga. All right, Josh, we will talk about Leah first. You uh, said something very interesting to me this week. You always do, in fact. But it's about a moment that comes in every fighter's career, and it's one of the most important for Leah. It came in her last fight against Janae Harding. What is it? Well, the reason why I know this moment, because it went, it happened to me several times throughout my career. It's when you realize that you're a fighter. And her fight with Janae Harding, she was not winning that fight. She was actually taking huge shots. She was in a lot of trouble. She got sat right there in that takedown, kind of a punch slash takedown attempt. But then she still kept fighting. She fought as hard as she could. She landed a beautiful up kick, rocked Janae. Janae goes into the triangle, gets the finish. As a fighter in your career, those are the moments you live for. You want to know, am I a real fighter or am I not? Will I tuck tail and run or will I stand and throw? And she stood there, she made it, she got the win, and great performance by her on that Indeed, night. a defining moment for Aaliyah McCour uh, McCourt in her burgeoning career. But her opponent tonight, Jessica Borga, I mean, she's faced a lot of adversity inside and outside the cage in life. Um, she's coming here to win tonight, no doubt about it. Stylistically, they match up quite similar. How's it gonna go? Very similar, but I give Jessica Borga the speed advantage. I give her the wrestling advantage. And I also give her the ability to hit submissions from the top position. So if Jessica Borga gets to the top position, you're gonna see she has great transitions when she hit Live Rock here. She hit her with a nice arm bar transition, rolled her through, able to get the leg over the head. Nicely done, but it all started with fast hands and a takedown attempt that got to that position. She got to the back, beautiful transition to the arm bar. Nice job. Leah's got her hands full tonight. Okay, she might have been hoping for an easier fight after Janae. That may not be the case. We will have to wait and see. But now for more on our co-main event tonight, we'll go cage side to Janae Kwachi, who's with Garrett A. Davies.
Thanks so much, Aidan. Yes, I am with Gareth A. Davies here. And Gareth, the co-main event tonight. It is an exciting prospect. Both of them really suited with styles as well. Absolutely. Look, for Leah McCourt, undefeated in her Bellator career, 4-0, number five in the rankings, super mum as she is from Belfast, in this extraordinary live BBC iPlayer event. First time ever. Seismic shift for the sport in this country against Jessica Borger, who is a difficult opponent, 3-3 three three in her career, but her, her, her results belie her abilities. Action hero, uh, in films outside it. Fantastic fighter. They will lock horns grappling tonight, but I think Leah McCourt will come out on top. She's a fantastic judoka, and she is used to getting out of the jaws of defeat and into victory. It's a really thrilling fight, and of course at the top of the division is the greatest female fighter of all time, Chris Cyborg. This is a fight that Leah McCourt must win if she's to continue her ascent in the division. When we saw Leah McCourt's last fight, we see that things can turn around quite quickly for her. Can she afford to do that tonight against Jessica Borger? Well, you know, she gets herself out of trouble. Those up kips that got her out of trouble, as you say, against Janae Harding were extraordinary. But she is the favorite tonight, and she'll want to impose herself from the very beginning of the fight. Well, thanks very much. It's an exciting prospect for sure. So let's head back to you, Sean. And we are looking forward to not only that tonight, obviously, I don't expect it's going to be too long before we see Chris Cyborg back in the Bellator cage defending her title. There is a fascinating similarity between these two that has potential to make this a great matchup. Both of these ladies are very good at the grappling realm. Borga likes to stand. McCourt has been working on her stand-up, but McCourt is very good with her judo and taking her opponents to the ground and getting good positions and putting a ground and pound on them. This is an interesting matchup. That fight at 145, the co-main event now, unusual little detour for us. We're going down to 115 for this one. This is a 115 pound straw weight fight, but both of these young ladies can fight. And you're looking at in the, the Beastie Barbie, I love that name. You're looking at Pinko, who is very good with what she does in submissions. 25 years of age compared to 30 years of age. Both of them always come to compete and compete hard. This should be a fun fight. Tonight here, Bellator 267, the prelims continue now as we go to the straw weight division scheduled. For three five-minute rounds, introducing first the blue corner at five foot three, weighing in 115.4 pounds. Her professional record: five wins, two losses. Fighting out of Frankfurt, Germany, Katarina Tigress Thalista. And across the cage, her adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot five, weighing in 114.8 pounds as a professional. She stands at five and three. She fights out of Livorno, Italy, presenting Kiharada Beastie Barbie Penko. In charge of the action, once again, referee Jaron Villel. Livorno, Italy, have you been there? Port City, Tuscan region. That's 15 miles from Pisa. It's a nice place, isn't it? Yeah, I, it looked like it on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've been there. Fight, fight. Of course you have. <laughs> okay, While generalities are the tip of the sword, what differentiates a strawweight fight? Usually what you're looking at in the strawweight besides the 115 pound limit is all of these ladies are fast. You're going to see a lot of strikes. Now, the, the hard part is they can't have with the hands the same kind of power that you're expecting out of someone that is a 145-pound fighter, like a Chris Cyborg. They're not going to have that power. But the knees, the kicks, the elbows, all of those can get the knockouts, too. Nice exit right there. Belisa did a very nice job. If you're going to have that, you're going to lose that position, make them pay and exit by landing a good shot. She did that. And if you don't think exits are important from certain positions, you can watch the knockout, the Lima knockout. We've watched a thousand times now of MVP about keeping yourself safe. 
That's it. You know, everything is about range and understanding your distance and your range. But when you get into a clinch, obviously you are so close in that clinch that you have to be careful, especially in MMA with the elbows. The elbows are huge. Pinko kind of jumped to that position. That was a dangerous position. spot to do that. Very strange that at this moment when she, you could see she was actually okay with what the stand-up positionings were doing. She was land, going after landing straight shots. Decided to take this into the guard position. We'll see what she does with it. She's really trying to get up high with it. Doesn't have a lot of room. Lisa has been a training partner of Korshed Kukarov, who we just saw, and Daniel Feichel. Penko right now, you know, bringing those legs up, it's a high guard, but there's no real threat. There's nothing there at this time that's going to give Delisa any problems. She's the one that's got the better position, being in top, being able to land. Penko going after the arm. Nice job by Penko. Trying to straighten She's it out. Keep that in her hip area. Don't let it leave. Lisa trying to use her left foot. There That's you it. Go. She got it. Delisa went for the Hail Mary. She knew she was in trouble, but could not escape it. And Penko knew what she was doing. There you go. Going for the guard in the first place. She jumped for it and then was able to get off the fence. And that gave her the room to get the arm. And we were wondering why did she you know decide she actually pulled guard but she knew what she wanted she knew what she was going to go for did a nice setup went for that arm almost lost the position you saw it getting out of that hip area where she could extend and put pressure on the elbow but she sucked it back in got that tap Here she goes, this is when she locks it up, and you see is trying to pull back. Usually when you're getting pulled back, that's not a good thing because that's actually leading towards the extension of the arm. You see her keeping the arm tight, and here's the point where she starts to put pressure. All of that pressure, hyperextending that elbow. Very nice submission move by Pink. Should she have gone forwards instead of backwards? Absolutely. Crush the space. Don't extend the space. Unless you know that you are slippery and you got to figure they're in the first round, there's not a whole lot of sweat there. If you're in the third round and you want to try to pull up because you're slippery, that might help you. Okay. Fifth career submission win for Chiara Penko. Michael C. Williams makes it official. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap comes by way of an arm bar. The official time, two minutes, 45 seconds into round number one. The winner by submission, Kiara Beastie Barbie Penko. Well, Beastie Barbie found a doll whose arm didn't bend that way. <laughs> Got another win. Yara Penko goes to six and three, her fifth career submission win. Guys, that was pretty impressive. Really impressive. Prelims are flying here in London, but we are only warming up for our main card tonight. Here is a reminder of our stacked five fight main card. Of course, it is headlined by the eagerly anticipated rematch between Douglas Lima and Michael Venom Page. It goes down on Showtime at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 o'clock Pacific. And also on the card tonight, there is a fight that there's a huge buzz uh, around the place for. It's a featherweight contest. It's been brewing for a long time. And it's Scotland's Robert the Hammer Whiteford who will be taking on the English veteran Andrew Fisher. So, Josh, why has this one got all MMA fans and indeed experts buzzing? Because neither one of them likes to shoot. Even though we're going to see some highlights here of Fisher taking a shot and getting to the double unders, getting the takedown, he said, no, look, don't look for me to shoot during this fight. He's going to look to use his jab, set up his one two and just let the hands fly but with Whiteford Whiteford is known for his power and his in and what he throws and every time he makes the transition
Stevens. He steps in on the south pole, throws a straight left. He was losing that fight against Sam Cecilia. He, had, he hadn't won, I don't think, one minute of that whole fight. With 30 seconds left, able to land a great uppercut. He landed a shot right before that, and then finished the fight with six seconds left to steal the fight. Great job by White. It ain't over till it's over, of course. That fight happened here in this very arena. Perhaps he'll be hoping for something the same tonight. Now, Robert Whiteford is on a four-fight win streak. So, too, is Andrew Fisher. And his belief, Josh, and he believes he exemplified it in his last fight, is that he's got the better fighter IQ, the better all-round game, and that he's more controlled, and he can avoid the hammers. Yeah, I would think that he's a little bit more of a te technician, as you're seeing here. He pops the jab in the face. He sets up his the rest of his combinations with his jab. Everything comes from that jab. And even Whiteford said, Fisher's jab is going to be something I have to deal with throughout the fight. So he's got to make sure he steps offline. But what Fisher's going to do, he's going to stick the jab, throw the calf kick, come back up top with the heavy combinations. And I think he's going to have success as long as he doesn't stand in front of Whiteford for too long. Okay, it's a pick and fight. That's why everyone is talking about it. Two high-level veterans. It features on our main card later on tonight. But now we are back in the featherweight division for our next prelim. So, all right, and, and John, the, one of the reasons I'm looking forward to that fight, those two guys have a familiarity with each other, having been around for so long and around the scene and sort of around each other tangentially, and I, I don't think they're going to waste a lot of time. No, and they have a ton of respect for each other, but each believes that they have what it takes to beat the other. This right here is Fabra Kari yeah. Jetta. And he is, I'm telling you, he reminds me of Matt Hughes when it comes to he gets a slam in every fight. He is super fast, super strong, and he is just tough. He out toughs his opponents in every match, and he's going to have to do that with Nathan Rose because we have seen Nathan Rose has power. He's got strength. He's got length. He is explosive, but he's going to have his hands full with a guy that's going to be in his face for an all 15 minutes. 145 getting more interesting by the day in Bellator. As you can see, Nathan Rose right now, 5'11 to 5'9, but both these guys carry power and are super strong. This should be a very interesting matchup between two athletic fighters. To Michael C. Williams. We welcome those streaming tonight's prelims live on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports here at the SSE Arena Wembley. We go now to three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 145 pounds even. His professional record, seven wins, three losses from Thornton Heath, London, England, Nathan the Black Rose. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145.2 pounds. The undefeated professional enters with seven victories, no defeats from Abervia, Paris, France. Introducing Fabrakari Jetta. In charge of the action, your referee, Mike Beltran. Rose fighting in front of the home folks. 145 is going to get very interesting very soon. With AJ McKee now on top. Tricio Pitbull is still the champion at 155. Nice low calf kick by Nathan Rose. Always, when you have opposite stances, that changes the leg kick game, too. Well, one of the things you'll notice out of Fabakari Jetta is he throws a lot of straight shots. He doesn't loop a whole lot of punches. Straight shots are going to get there faster. And somewhere within this fight, I guarantee if it lasts any amount of time, there will be a big slam from Jetta. It's a big promise. You've made that I'm promise to twice. I'm telling you, every fight I've ever watched him in. 
seven straight wins. You saw just 24 years old. See Luke Trainer later on tonight. That nice right hand. Yeah, no question. It's been a bad month for undefeated young fighters in Bellator. That's like to be partying with the big tune of the last few weeks. <laughs> Uh, you know, you got it. everyone that's talking about Ben Paris, and that hit. that was a huge win. And it's one of those, I love that kind of win because no one expected it. Everyone counted him out because he doesn't have that Greek god statue-like body. But the man can fight. That's something of an understatement. Yes, and it is. And the combinations of Josh so quick. But as we look at another undefeated young fighter, Always important to remember that this is the thing about Bellator. When you're signing the young blue chip fighters, I think those who have watched the sport for a long time aren't accustomed to seeing the early fights. And you might see a fighter for the first time walk onto a big stage who's 11 and 2 or 12 and 2 on an eight fight win streak, but you didn't see those two. You didn't see those two losses that were there early on when they were making mistakes. And you, you're going to have mistakes when you're learning how to fight because. Everything that you're taught, you just cannot take and just put into play when it's game time in the cage, the lights are on. You're going to have to learn those moments. But one of the things I will tell you about Jetta, take a look at what he's doing. He's very calm, very relaxed. He's the one when he wants to, he decides, I'm going to go after you. And again, not a lot of excessive movement, but very straight, and he puts got a lot of power on his shots. So when you throw those straight shots, they get there fast. It's not easy just to counter or to block. He doesn't waste movement either. Nathan Rose, calling the Black Rose. It's like that flower that came from the concrete. Difficult upbringing here in London. Nathan's doing a good job of controlling when he's in that southpaw position. You'll see him switch it back and forth. Now back to orthodox. Too quick. Very nice, easy defense by Jetta. interesting to me to see the footprints of a round and this one has stayed largely in the inner circle it has neither guy wants to be on his back foot both are trying to press it forward Papa Curry has been able to a little bit more control the distance and where the fight's gonna occur at but Rose is doing a very nice job Himself nice and composed, landing good shots. Good knee inside, Jetta. Striking here. Here's Jetta with that right hand falling with the left. The right landed, the left didn't. Rose was able to get himself out of the way. You see how the right hand lands. Left hand just misses. It's been a back and forth battle, very close by both guys, both landing good shots at times. Next 145 fight we have in the top 10 coming up is Daniel Weichel and Pedro Carvalho coming up in Dublin. Certainly opportunity towards the bottom. Emmanuel Sanchez stays towards the top. Adam Borch, to me, I mean, you and I saw one of the most jarring knockouts I certainly have ever seen uh, in Budapest a few years ago. 
You know, Mads Burnell is going to be in this conversation. Mads Burnell is so good on the ground, so fun to watch in the way he sets up his submissions. Three punch combination starts round two for Chiata. But you see Rose starting to push a little bit more, trying to control where it's at. Right hand by Rose. They come in low. I think it's it swept across, made contact with the cup. Not super hard, but just bodies in motion. More than Nathan Rose can push Jetta back and make him fight off his back foot, the better chance he has of taking control of this fight, getting a win. Most of the time, you see Jetta always trying to come forward. And he wanted where it is now. That's what he wanted the entire first round, but Rose has been keeping him out outside. Found a home. One thing you're seeing out of Favakari is he's, he's always trying to hide those kicks behind the hands. You're seeing the hands come out, getting Rose to react, and then comes the kick, which means that normally it's going to land with more a solid impact. See right there, that's raw dogging. Nothing was before it, so it was an easy block. Just throwing out that kick lead with no hands, nothing to make Jetta have to react to the hands first. Say it again for people who missed what you call it. Raw dogging it. <laughs> is that part of the MMA encyclopedia? That is part that of the, that is a, that is a, that's a Josh Thompson word, and that's I love it. No question. <laughs> he doesn't know a lot of words, but that is definitely one <laughs> that he would use. Jetta starting instead of the combinations that we're seeing earlier is going more towards just one punch. He needs to get back to those combinations like we just saw. What makes a fighter abandon the combinations he has undoubtedly been coached to throw to go to one of them? Well, a lot of it is being countered, unsure that they're not going to get hit by throwing more than they think. If I throw one, I'm not going to get hit. If I end up throwing a one, two, three, there's a possibility that I can get hit. Very true, but there's also a possibility that one, two, or three, that three being the one that lands and puts your opponent on his butt. Of course, the level change. Nice job by Rose to defend. That was almost half-hearted. Like, let me throw something different in there. It was. It was not a good level change. It wasn't a good takedown attempt. He got into the leg, but not. There was never a chance that that was going to work. These guys are going to make it hard on the judges because there's a lot of yeah. volume going back yep. and forth, but not a whole lot of damage. Yeah, this to me is a very difficult round to call. Jada trying to put some of those leg kicks in the bank. You heard that one. Yep. That's the kind of thing that's going to influence the judge. And then that nice takedown right there. But look at what Jada does. Ooh, and got it left in. Right back to the feet. So there was no takedown. Takedown has to be established. You have to do something with it. That was a change of position. You gotta have both feet down with the ball. Or it's not <laughs> there a catch. you go, there you go.
both rows and Jed are very, very athletic, fast. Take a look, take a look at the way some of these shots are coming out. And if they still have that, and there, it is, there it is. There's my slam. Right at the end of the round. <laughs> and that could have been significant trouble had it not been right at the end of the round. But again, in a extremely close round two, that's how you want to finish it. It is. That is exactly how you want to finish it. And this is the kicks that Jada is doing inside. Take a look at when he's throwing. That landed. You can see how the elbow clinched in. That was a nice body shot to the rib cage. Again, those are the difference makers in this round. And that nice little takedown and a couple shots at the end, that might have swung the judge's opinion on who they believe won that round. Let's have a judging conversation about this topic. It seems the last thing anybody ever wants to do is write down 10-10. Yes. For a dead even round because of what it's going to invariably lead to in a three-round fight. But a 10-10 round is a 10 round. If it's a dead even round, isn't it your obligation to call it that? Absolutely. If you look at it and say, man, there is no, there was absolutely zero advantage in the striking there was zero advantage in the grappling uh oh what just happened that we just saw at the end so when you look at the criteria if you're saying that it was even on that striking and you go to grappling you just saw who won the grappling straight right hand down the pipe everything about this fight has been straight down the middle <laughs> A lot of speed and a lot of power by both guys here. Differences you're starting to see right now, Sean, is take a look at what Nathan Rose is doing. He's throwing a lot of ones, where Jada's doing what? He's throwing more in combination. That's going to usually lead to him having the advantage. Switch stance by Rose. Start to wonder about those earlier leg kicks now. Is Rose moving as fluidly as he was earlier. Still moving well, and he's, you know, I don't think he's got any problem with his legs at all, but he is throwing ones, and he needs to start going back to throwing in combinations. right there and that's the difference right now that you're seeing in this fight Jean is the guy overall that has been landing more in combinations not instead of that one shot landing and now we're going to reset right there one two by Nathan didn't land and he eats the leg kick the inside of the leg nice counter by Jean Jab, cross kick, jab, cross kick, jab, cross kick. Working well for him. It is. And that sets up a successful and legitimate take. Right now, Rose should not accept this position. He needs to get his back off of the ground. When your back is flat on that ground, that is bad. At least get to your side, start working that underhook. Nice. Lost it. Trying to transition too high. But he got himself up and out. Nice job by Nathan Rose. what happens when you do 
unintentional by Nathan Rose. He no way was wanting to throw that kick and land in that space. He was just trying to press the action and get into Giada and make him up, fight up against the cage where he didn't have room to back himself up because he takes a, a he likes to take and take a back step and then come forward with his counter. That's why I wonder if his legs are as solid as they were earlier in the fight. And they definitely might not be. But again, did a very nice yeah. job getting back himself up. back to his feet. Did not accept the position. to the yes. ribs time and time again. Right kick to the left, to the left ribs. Tells you you need the big shot, but your body's like, I don't know if I have it left. Yeah, yeah not even close. Not even. Shot is still landing. Nice yep. kicks. Comes one more takedown. Really smart, straightforward, disciplined. Come right at you, fight. Bye, John. Just 24 years old is Jonathan, and you can see the effect of the leg kicks and those shots that Nathan Rose took to the ribs. The shots that Nathan Rose took, those kicks to the ribs, look, he did an outstanding job of accepting those and moving through them, but they take a toll. There's no doubt they're taking the air out of you. They're sucking your gas tank a little bit drier. He fought a beautiful fight. He just didn't have the volume and output of his opponent. Every breath hurts. <laughs> you would eat those. You can just see the difference in the styles as far as the the fighters and their enthusiasm, the corner, yep. the way yep. they're looking. Yeah, Nathan Rose there has a degree in accounting, but I don't think you're going to need one to add up the scorecards in this one. Michael C. Williams will make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance inside the Bellator cage, will go to your three judges. All three judges scored exactly the same. Michael Murtha, Doug Crosby, Eric Cologne. They all have it 30 to 27, all for the winner by unanimous decision. Babakari Jetta. And another undefeated young fighter on the rise in Bellator. And guys, coming up later tonight in the main card, we're going to see another one at 2.05. We're starting to garner a little buzz. Boy, we are. Mr. You bet we will. Sean and Josh Thompson is sitting here texting all his buddies on the West Coast to say 1 p.m. showtime. You've got to be tuned in chiefly to see Michael Page take on Douglas Lima in the most highly anticipated rematch in Bellator MMA history. Certainly one off, but also to see a big matchup at 205. Luke the Gent trainer taking on Yannick Bahadi. Why are you texting all your buddies telling them to watch that, Josh? Absolutely. Sean Granny was just talking about Luke Trainer is one of those young prospects that everyone is buzzing about right now. He's 6'6", explosive, good on the ground. His attacks are all over the place. I can't wait to watch him fight tonight. Indeed. Now, I uh, was going to say to you, does he have the credentials to go all the way to the top? And you stopped me right there and says, he doesn't have the credentials, but he does have the potential. Yeah, yeah you, you can't get the two things mixed up. 
When he gets to the ground, he's nasty on top. He's got long limbs, long legs. He attacks the naked choke, the rear naked choke really well, as well as the guillotine. That body style plays very well in MMA, whether it's on the feet or on the ground. He loves to use that up kick and that push kick. He loves to use a stiff jab, and he stays long with his strikes. He's talented. That's what you were trying to get at. The potential is there. But in terms of him getting there, he's got a little bit of a ways to go. He's 4-0, he's undefeated, but great stuff. It's a huge night from here in his hometown. We'll talk about his opponent in a moment. But there's a lot to this guy outside of the Bellator cage. He's a big guy at 6'6", six six, but he's also got a huge heart. I'm sorry about this, guys. How are you guys? Okay? My lad say hello and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Sharif, nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. And now, from Stevenage, Luke Trainer. Well, Luke Trainer has some story. A very different kind of MMA fighter who wants to be known as the Gent. My family environment is beautiful. It's, I, li I live right now, I live at home with my mum and dad. Kid, come through, guys. Say hello. Say hello, boys. I move out on the 1st of November. I'm becoming an adult, I guess. My mum and dad have fostered since I was 12. It's taught me a lot about life in general, life outside of my own nice, loving family. Dan, you can walk next to me, bud. No, don't walk Get used to this, mate. When you become a famous bodybuilder, you know what I mean? You can tell them all about the bicep curls you do and the press-ups. Yeah. <laughs> Dan come with his, uh, his whole family to us four years ago. They were all shells of themselves. You look at them four years on, you see Dan. He is one of the most loving human beings you'll ever meet. He's confident, he goes to college, he goes to the gym every single day. <laughs> Fostering's made the biggest impact on me in my entire life. To be able to help other human beings in this world is, I think that should be everyone's purpose. Uh, two, three, two. If you don't mind me saying yeah, that, but sure. like when Dan first come to us, uh, and Chanel and Yasmin and, and their older brother, um, you know, they were they were quiet, they they come in, they weren't too sure about weren't too sure about us, obviously, because it's he, uh, you know, you can't imagine unless you go through it. But when he first came to the house, he wouldn't he wouldn't look you in the eyes. And now Every person who comes into the house, he greets with a massive hug, and he's the most lovable kid you can yeah. meet. So it's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's all nervous because of the cameras, bless him. The fight on the 1st of October, this is going to be an absolute war. <laughs> Yannick is a savage. I have nothing but respect for the guy, but it is a battle of... Who is the more savage? We're going to go in there, touch gloves, and see what happens. I can't wait. I'm very excited to just let all the violence out and then shake hands after and all that jazz. I've got aspirations when I grow up to open up children's homes. That's my main goal in life. Once I've done that, I can say, sweet, I've done my bit in life. I can, you know, I can die a peaceful man. But until I do that, no matter what belts I win, no matter what accolades I've, I've gained in fighting, this is not important. Yeah, he's quite a character, he's isn't he? Cool. Loving every single moment. Luke Trainer, watch out for him. What a remarkable young man, Josh. Absolutely amazing. We talked, we had a second to talk with him during the week. Wonderful kid, wonderful kid. Well, as he said, he is up against a savage tonight. That comes in the considerable form of Yannick Bahati. And Josh, Yannick needs to get back in the win column tonight. So how extra dangerous does that make him? Yeah, but don't let the losses fool you. Here's the thing with him. As you can see, he was up, he's a, a powerhouse of a man. Super strong, going up from 185 to 205 because the weight cut was, was hurting his, his performances. And so what happens is he decided to go up in weight. He was great this whole week in conversation. He had an energy about him that I hadn't seen in him in years. And so the fact that I feel like the weight cut was really getting him, we've seen it in the sport, fighters going up in weight, I think he's going to have a great performance tonight. Indeed, it is going to be an explosive matchup at light heavyweight. But now it is back to the prelim. Sean. All right, guys, and a couple of local veterans. And we were kind of kind of excited about this one, talking about it earlier in the week here. A couple of veterans at welterweight. This is like a throwback fight, yeah. in my opinion. Jack Grant has got outstanding jujitsu, and you're looking at Nathan Jones, a 
former K-1 kickboxer, a guy that on his feet, dangerous from a lot of positions there. This should be fun. Let's check out the tail. Taylor Tape in this welterweight matchup, very simple. Jack Grant has got that reach advantage at 76.5, but I don't think it matters because when he gets his game going, it's very tight, very close on the ground. Nathan Jones definitely has the advantage in the stand-up. Reach may not be a factor in this. <laughs> Tonight here at the SSE Arena Wembley, live on BBC iPlayer, the Bellator 267 prelims continue now with three, five, minute rounds in the welterweight division introducing the blue corner at six foot weighing in 170.6 pounds his professional record 13 wins 10 losses fighting out of richmond england nathan mr baggington jones and across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot one, weighing in 169.4 pounds in his Bellator debut. He brings 17 professional victories, seven defeats, fighting out of Grimsby, England, Jack Brunt. In charge of the action, referee Mike Beltran. Mike was going to lead a yoga class there for a second. <laughs> Definitely has a style. Oh, big miss yep. by Nathan Jones there. This is exactly where Jack Grant wants to be. Not that Nathan Jones is not good on the ground. He just doesn't have the background experience that Jack Grant has with his jujitsu. What was Nathan Jones trying to do with his right knee there? He's, what he's doing is he's framing out, keeping the hips away, using, instead of strength and holding, use that framing so you can hold the position and not be hurt. Nice job. Real teachable moments here because, as I've said many times, that to me is the most said, unappreciated, non-discussed part of this sport is what happens along the fence. It looks like it's a break in the action when it's the exact opposite. That's a good left. That was a good left to the body. And a counter right. But you'll notice Jack Grant's hands, they're coming down when he's yep. throwing. Nathan Jones will see that and he'll take advantage of it. So Nathan Jones has to feel good about that first clinch. Didn't get taken to the ground. He had double unders on him, worked his way through it. That means a lot to him. Oh! Takes a big shot. Grant tries to go for the jump knee. He's going to get this takedown. Yeah, though. he is. You've said this about many fighters before, and Grant going for it. He's feeling something that we don't necessarily see. That was almost a, a fight ending kind of moment. And he's just trying to force his way to the finish line here. Well, he's definitely going after him. He's trying to put him away. Nathan Jones is in trouble and here. He is now. He's trying to go to his side. He is now by Beltran giving it a good look. He needs to use that leg inside, try to get those feet on the hips, get some space. Jack Grant saw something that we didn't see, and you saw how slow Nathan Jones was to get his left arm up. That's why those first shots got in just now. A lot of time left in the round. He's giving his back. Not a yep. good thing against a guy with the, the background that Jack Grant has. That's it. You said many times about many guys, John. They're great at being the hammer, but not so much at being the nail. That is absolutely the truth. And not, you know, what happened in this sequence, though, is we go back, we're going to see one of those shots absolutely hurt Nathan Jones more than he let on. Jack Grant saw it. He saw it. No yeah, doubt exactly about it. right. He went after him, put a lot of energy out in finishing him, got to that position where referee Mike Beltran had seen enough. He opened up Nathan Jones. Very impressive debut. Yeah, and that's, Jack Grant. I mean, that you couldn't script it any better because when you are a nine-year veteran, 29 years old, you've had 24 fights, and you finally walk onto the big stage, you want to put on a show. Oh, you want that exact type of fight to happen. You want everything that occurred there. Ah! Couldn't ask for anything more. 
right there that overhand right was the one it definitely set him up watch that he's hurt comes the jump knee not that that really hurt but he was hurt by that right hand that's why he gets these hands around clasps his hands together picks him up dumps him down onto the cage from that moment just systematically beat him down and it was almost from Jack Brandt's body language, we got an indication of just how hurt Nathan Jones was. Like, he sensed it. It didn't seem like the fight was about to end, but he knew it was. Absolutely. Michael C. Williams will make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. Two minutes, 16 seconds into round number one. The winner by TKO, Jack. of his 18 wins now have come by knockout and 17 of the 18 by stoppage Jack Grant has a successful Bellator debut he's got a conversation upcoming with John McCarthy he's got everything but a nickname which he said I don't want I just want to be ladies Jack. and gentlemen I'm here with your winner Jack Grant Jack that was explosive you missed the first takedown when you got the underhooks. You went back, you hit him with a big right hand, went after the flying knee. Talk to him about how you're feeling. Yeah, I feel great. I think I broke my toe, though. If you see me looking down during the fight, like, felt it went right. Had to be a bit more patient, but, you know, I'm the skinny power kid. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> you definitely put on a performance. Let's talk about your finish, though, because you were going after him hard putting a lot of heavy shots down. Did you know Did you know you were going to finish right then? Yeah, I felt like I'd hit him already prior to the ground and pound, and I just didn't want to let him off the hook because he's so experienced. I wouldn't want him to make a, a comeback, you know, and change this fight around, which he could have done. Well, you look fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Jack Grant. You didn't need to pantomime the contract to know what Jack Grant was fighting for tonight and he made his case and then some with a first round knockout of the veteran Nathan Jones trying to make his place and get in line at 170 a line that ends right now with the champion Arslav Amosov but tonight all eyes will be on the main event at 170 the two most decorated welterweights in Bellator history the long awaited rematch between Douglas Lima and MVP is here. That was a show. It's been the MVP show since he came to Bellator. Like a brutal dance routine. MVP right hand. And tonight, he owns this time. I'm taking over everybody. Everybody. Douglas. A bobblehead spun him around completely. That kid's a beast. A monster at 170. How good is that? These two have been around so long. They're part of the furniture in Bellator. <laughs> and there is an interesting similarity between McKee and Pitbull and the main event tonight in this regard when AJ McKee first arrived in Bellator Patricio Pitbull was already the world champion when MVP arrived in Bellator Douglas Lima was already the welterweight world champion There are two careers two completely different fighters They are the tortoise and the hare But it seems only fitting that for MVP to get to where he has always wanted to get he has to climb Mount Lima tonight You, you take a look at this fight obviously MVP wants to get that redemption he wants another shot at Lima Lima the only guy that's ever put that mark on his record but this is a super important fight for Douglas Lima <laughs> you take a look at what's been going on Douglas Lima just lost his title and if he loses to MVP tonight that's gonna set him back a long ways from him being able to get back to getting that title this was his first fight when he was champion against Rory McDonald and he ate Rory's leg up you look at the damage on Roy Shin he has never recovered from that damage. It actually separated the muscle from the bone. 
he is so devastating with his low leg kicks and MVP knows I can only take a couple of those and he knew that last time and even knowing it it was that low leg kick that set up the knockout Rory McDonald won that fight and yet after it was over and you know the wars he had been in you know better than anybody in the world the wars he's been in and Rory McDonald said Douglas Lima is the toughest fighter I've ever faced and uh, it's those leg kicks listen Andre Korshkov was the world champion, and when Douglas Lima knocked him out, he knocked him out. Lima was losing that fight, knocked out Korshkov anyway, and left such permanent damage, in a way, in the mind of Korshkov that he changed up the way he fought in their third meet. Went from being a dynamic striker to a guy that was just trying to wrestle. Now, he's a good wrestler, yeah. and he's a good all-around mixed martial artist, but his strength was his striking, and he got away from that because he didn't want to be damaged by Douglas Lima. That says everything about what this guy does inside the cage. And, you know, we've watched MVP from the beginning, and every spectacular highlight after every spectacular highlight, they're amazing to watch, but until he records, until he puts that big head on the wall, everyone's just always going to talk about who he has fought, not how he has won. Hey, well, and it's, it's so hard to understand how good this yeah. guy is. Everything that you're seeing here, look at all these shots. All of these are walk-offs as far as knockouts where he's taken a good fighter and been able to put him away and just walk away. Knockoffs, when we talk about knockouts and we talk about walk-offs from him, it's rare. MVP's probably got eight of them. Yeah. That's incredible when you think about the power he has, but it's his timing and his control of that timing and his accuracy that makes him powerful. Hey, David Rickles, Derek Anderson, these guys didn't walk off the bus. These are these are good fighters that he has beaten. But again, it's always it's, people are just conditioned to find something negative, and they're always going to find that in MVP. But as you said, find, how many other fighters have that many walk off? I mean, find he's, them. He's incredible, and I'll tell you what, if he can beat. Douglas Lima tonight, he is setting himself up to be that number one guy and get a shot at a guy who has never lost in Yaroslav Amazov. Guys, you can feel the buzz the last couple of days all around the city, and it's building towards the main event tonight. It certainly is, Sean. We haven't seen it like this in London for a long, long time, and for a very good reason, as you say, two of the best welterweights in the world in town to throw down for the second time. Josh, as we take a closer look at the numbers there, and we pick up on what the gentlemen were talking about, Michael Venom Page, what does he have to do to prove he's elite level? Well, let's talk real quick about the knockoff, the walk-offs. The walk-offs this. He's got eight of them. The only other person closest, as John and I were talking about earlier this week, is someone like Mark Hunt, who's got maybe five when you get into that conversation. Look, Douglas Lima with the power. Look, MVP's not going to change. When we're talking to him this week, he's not going to change what he does. He said, Sean Grady talked about um, Korshkov changing his game plan, changing the way he fights. He's not going to do that. He's going to make a couple adjustments because he was winning that first fight. Those little slight adjustments, I think, may be enough. Douglas Lima's got to get his confidence back on track and get himself out of gear two because that's what we're going to talk about a lot tonight is Douglas Lima needs to find gear three, possibly even gear four to win this fight. And lest we forget, after the devastating knockout of Michael Venom Page, he went on to beat Rory McDonald and to win the welterweight tournament and the $1 million prize. He is an elite level fighter. His legacy is cemented, but tonight he wants to make it 2-0 over MVP. It's our main event. It's coming up later on Showtime. And you know, the other wild card guys, a three round fight and not a five round fight. So that Douglas Lima, that slow start that he has fallen into in the past, that cannot happen. Now, we talk about records and resumes. Alina Kayanedu has some losses on her. She is still just 22 years old. Very young fighter and came into Bellator with a 7-0 record, but has found some difficulties in that experience and where she wants to keep the fight. She's got a very tough opponent. We've, we have seen Petra fight before. She is a very solid stand-up fighter. Look at the age difference here, 22 to 39. It is the difference of generations. We'll see if the young generation can take out the older one. The voice of a Bellator generation is Michael C. Williams. Tonight here in London at Bellator 267, the prelims continue now with three five-minute rounds in the flyweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot seven, weighing in 125.6 pounds. Her professional record four and three fighting out of Prague, Czech Republic, Petra 
Prochaskova. And across the cage, her adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot five, weighing in 124.4 pounds as a professional. Seven victories, four losses from Bratislava, Greece, presenting Elena Gunner Kalianenu. In charge, your referee, Jaron Vallel. So for perspective, we talk about losses and Galeonedu 7-0 in the regionals, 0-4 in Bellator. But let's talk about these four losses, particularly the first three. She lost to Anastasia Yankova when Yankova missed weight, and it was a huge difference between them and the cage. Chaskova grabbing holds of that leg to get the fight to the ground quickly. Nice job by Kachikova. She's in a nice, almost north-south, definitely has side control here. You're seeing Elena with that head. She needs to let go of the head. That's not going to do her any good right now with where she's at. Why? Because she has no legs or anything to control, and that arm can actually be put in a position where it's controlling her. Although she did a very nice <laughs> reversal right down. there. Beautiful job. Petra getting back to her feet. The other losses to Bruna Ellen, a very experienced fighter, and she fought Sinead Kavanaugh in Ireland, and Kavanaugh is a 145-er who you're going to hear a lot about in the next couple of weeks. So think about that difference. And she, she fought Sinead Kavanaugh at 18 years old. And Elena still holding on to the head. This is something she's got to stop doing. She does not have any type of submission here with what she's doing. Are you surprised she's not hearing that from coaches? <laughs> I'm surprised she's not hearing you. Right now, I believe her arm is almost trapped in a position where she can't let go of it. She's got that head in a position, the cage is up, she can't swing her arm out. Now she's rolling for a leg lock. Chaska was staying safe. She's in a position right now, she's not good. good. When, yeah. you, when you have that leg in the position that she has, she's look, she was looking towards an inverted heel hook. Kashkova needs to make sure she doesn't allow that leg to extend out. Right now, she can just use her legs to extend out away. She's looking for the heel hook. Going for it. Got it. That's a huge win right there. Huge win for her. All set up by her hooking the head. <laughs> no, Throwing her off. Right? You gotta stop with that. <laughs> it's like you let go of that. It's not a good, solid, strong position, but great job of deciding I'm gonna drop down, go for the leg. She went for it, ends up with the heel hook. Nice submission. You wonder why a fighter who is 0-4 in Bellator keeps getting chances. This is why, because of her age and her upside. Her first Bellator win was inevitable, and we see it in spectacular first-round fashion. And you look at who she has lost to in Bellator, and you're saying, man, those are all of them bigger fighters in different weight classes, and she has shown promise in her game just right there with that submission. Chaskova had never been submitted seven-year pro career. Look at the beautiful lock, yep. control of the leg, goes for that heel hook, and once that, it doesn't hurt in the beginning, but once that is, that leg is getting twisted, that knee is going to get torn apart. Beautiful submission win. Been a long time, over two and a half years since her last win. And the emotion pouring out of Elena Kalyanedu. Remember that name. On the rise at 125. You want to think about this, though, Sean. Our, the first time we watched Petra, she went three rounds with Denise Keyholz, yeah. who just went five rounds with the champion Champ. in Juliana Velasquez. Michael C. Williams makes it official. Ladies and gentlemen, the tap by way of a heel hook, official time. Two minutes, seven seconds in the round. Number one, the winner by submission, Elena Gunner Kalianedu. We 
relief, joy, and on to what's next. And a promising career for that young lady. Congratulations to Alina. It's been a long time coming, and she gets it done in spectacular fashion. Well, folks, we are nearing our five fight main card on Showtime. Four Eastern, one Pacific. Of course, we will be closing it out with a rematch that the world has waited two and a half years to see between the number one and two ranked welterweights, Douglas Lima and Michael Venom Page. But we will be opening the card uh, with a fun fight. We expect fireworks to be delivered between UK star Tim Wilde, who's hoping to kickstart a run at 155. That is is, Josh, if you can get past the rather unorthodox Frenchman, Yves Lanjou, who lit up the French capital on his Bellator debut. Yeah, he's explosive. He doesn't do anything that you would think outside of a normal fight. He will leave his feet at every chance, every opportunity he gets. In talking with him this week, I said, hey, so do you have a game plan? He's like, ah, I fight where the fight goes to the feet, goes to the ground. I'll take the fight here. I'll take the fight there. Those are fights, those are fighters that are hard to prepare for. You have no idea. Those are fighters that love to fight. Those are the most dangerous fighters to deal with. And you pressed them on that. You said, what's the game plan? You're going in against a very awkward and experienced Tim Wilde. He's like, we'll figure it out. It, it could go to the ground, it could go, it could go to the feet, it could keep it. He's like, I'm gonna leave my feet several times. Submission, you know, I get to the back. He's like, I'll take this fight anywhere. He is a real box of tricks. We look forward to seeing him inside the Bellator cage tonight. He is, a co uh, of course, in with the uh, much more experienced Tim Wilde, who had a baptism of fire in his Bellator debut. We were both there in Birmingham. He was in against the former lightweight champion, Bram Primus. And as he said himself, Josh, it was too much too soon. He was a rabbit in the headlights that night. Your first fight in the Bellator, that's a hard fight to take on. Bram Primus is nasty and good on the ground, very flexible for the size and strength of him. But Tim Wilde's made some adjustments. Came back, he got a win uh, against Leary that has, he's, he's tall, long, lanky. And if you see them at the weigh-ins, I believe Madu can, he can end up being a 45-pounder eventually. But right Right now, he's tonight gonna have to fight Tim Wilde. All right, uh, I'm just was looking for my pen to make a note of how many times Josh is gonna say tall, long, and lanky. Would you describe Michael Venom Page as that? Yes. Okay, <laughs> well, we are gonna hear from Michael Venom Page now. Earlier in the week, Lateo Muhammad caught up with the British superstar. I'm here at London Shoot Fighters Gym to try my hand at mixed martial arts and hopefully pick up a few tips from Bellator's main man, Michael Venom Page. Let's get into it. What's good, Michael how Venom you Page? Good to see you, my you man. Too, man. Good you to see you, my too. man. Tell me a bit more how you got into this sport and why MMA? I've been doing uh, combat sports in general. Did the freestyle kickboxing, so similar to Taekwondo. Yes. Since I was five years old, I achieved a lot in kickboxing. I'm Ten times world champion. Ooh. I wanted to. I wanted to change. It's time for us to square up. Uh oh. Is it yeah. time for me to raise the bar? Oh yeah. <laughs> and then we'll get in the cage. I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> That ring walk is important. Mm. You need to show exactly what would you do. Okay. It's time. Woo! Ooh. LT versus MVP. You yeah, ready? Yeah, yeah. You okay. ready? You know I'm gonna raise the bar. Uh, you know I'm gonna raise right. the bar. Hands down. Right. Hands down. I'm the guy. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> See now I'm worried. You're all about the showman. Where did that come from? The Rock was somebody that I felt like just had the crowd in his hand, in his pocket, took notes, and then come up with, you know, what we see as MVP today. Michael Page has the Infinity Stones! He is turning all of his opponents to dust! We see the face-off when fighters are face-to-face. -face. Now, I'm gonna approach you. So what's going through your head when it's like this? Like I say, you're always trying to see the fear in the person. Straight away, I make myself bigger than you. Woo! It breaks something in, in you. Can you show up for me one more yeah. time? I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, MVP. If I was serious about genuinely making the transition into MMA, yeah. what do you think I should start with? Well, it's important to understand your strengths, the striking element. So you have to be comfortable with your grappling. OK, I'm going to show you a quick move that, again, a lot of people will probably try to do to yourself. We call it a single leg. So it's trying to separate the two, grab one leg. But I need to occupy his hands first, because that's what's going to help him defend my takedown. So I throw the punch as a distraction, 
and step in with my back leg, cross my hands together, pick it up, and now this is a single leg. Okay. Very simple. You're going to okay, take my place. No, but let's make this happen. <laughs> I'm going to sell the punch. Good. Come in Good. here. Squat down. Him up. Squat Good. down. Palm to palm. Palm to palm. So I'm here, Good. back straight, then. Good. Pick up the leg. Good. Keep your, Keep your head in. Keep your head tight, yeah. Yeah? yeah? Just like that. That's perfect. Now, the whole purpose of getting the single leg is so I can take my opponent down to the floor. Exactly the same thing, I throw my punch to open up, step in, palm to palm, pick up the leg. Now, watch my step. I'm gonna step forward with my left leg and back with my right, and I'm gonna drop my chest on his knee. Woo! Yeah. Okay. We're gonna start the same way. I'm gonna throw the punch. Yes. I'm gonna step in, because yep. now he's opened up. Good, I'm good. Come in. Palm to palm, remember? Palm to palm. palm, palm, to palm. Now pick up the leg. Good. Uh, but stay Keep tight. It, yes. Now what I'll I'll take step, step back. forward with your left foot. Step forward with my left foot. Yeah. yeah. And step back and squat down and look down towards the floor. Oh, okay. there you go. Perfect. And he's in position. Natural. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, so this bit is probably more suited to yourself. Okay. We're gonna add a kick to it. So, to force my opponent mm -hmm. to bring himself down, I step towards the leg as if I'm gonna do something, and I land the kick. Wow. Yeah. I'm on my toes. Good, you know, good, not, good. You know nice. I'm just here, this I'm just chilling. You. Yeah, yeah, this I'm is MVP. Hey, 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 okay, you. okay. And I step in. Boom, boom. 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 There you go. Teeps are a big thing, okay. and learning how to block a teep is important, it drops your hand. So a teep, pushing your toes in towards the body, you can get like the solar plex and really win people, Ooh, yeah. yeah? Maybe in Taekwondo, I'd sell it like I'm coming here, but in MMA, I want to sell it like it's a teep. It's a little bit... So a little deeper teep, yeah. then you come go, up beautiful. just like that. I actually feel like I've learned more about the sport of MMA. I'll let you handle <laughs> the business. I'll be the spectator for now. <laughs> Thank you, my man. Well, every day is a school day, even if you are a 2016 Olympic Taekwondo medalist. Thank you to Lateo Mohammed for bringing us that insight with the Mercurial MVP. Josh, when you talk about fighter IQ, what grade do you give MVP? I would give him an A+. Plus. I would give him A+. Plus. Actually, I would probably take it to just a flat A, because he has that one loss to Lima. And that's it, but he's made those adjustments in the fighter meetings we talked about. Six inches forward, six inches back, and how much of a difference it makes is somebody like uh, Douglas Lima, who possesses power in his right hand as well as his left hook, and those devastating leg kicks is what started it all. And that six inches is what he feels cost him that fight. He definitely is a cerebral Pfizer. He's been stewing on this one, dwelling on this, and as he also told us in the fighter meetings, Joshy, he can be petty. He wants it back. He told us a story about uh, when he was an amateur and uh, he lost to a guy. He took the loss, but the guy said one thing to him. It annoyed him. And for seven years, he waited for revenge and he got it. Like you just called me Joshy. So I'm gonna, <laughs> so I can understand. I'm gonna be petty about that for seven years. No, I understand. He had beat someone who he had looked up to for a while. He had finally beat him when he was younger. And then the guy was very disrespectful after. And he carried with that carried him with, carried that with him for seven years until he was able to face him again and beat him and let him know that, hey, you were disrespectful and I was, I've been waiting for that. That's petty, but it's also someone in their mind who thinks about that and it just eats them alive and they just try to figure out a way to be better every single day to beat that one person. That's what makes him as good as he is today. All right, are you petty for me calling you, Joshy? No, it's all right. We'll go back to JT. Now, we have some serious sporting royalty in the SSE arena in Wembley tonight. I can't believe how full already it is. We're uh, more than an hour out from our main car beginning, but there's a lot of excitement and there's a lot of famous faces in the house. We're gonna go down to Jeanette Quachi, and she was with one of the greatest boxers of all time, Mr. Roy Jones Jr. You got that right in terms of royalty aids and I am cage side here with the wonderful Roy Jones Jr. And Roy, this is very different for you, the, the shape of the ring for a start, but how are you enjoying yourself this evening? I'm really enjoying myself, you know, I like any kind of combat sport. Uh, to see such great as my man right here, I mean, it's, just, it's always great to be in the presence of people like him. So I just love being at these events, the crowd is electric, this country loves fighting. 
I mean, what better place to be in? And for you, you'll be back here tomorrow. Of course, it's a different setup. But to be in the arena and see the atmosphere and feel the vibe, how is that for you? Yes, it feel, it's very good because it gives me an opportunity to fill it out before we actually come in live. It won't be my, it won't be my first time in here tomorrow, so I feel good about it. And listen, I'm not going to push you on who the favorites are tonight, but I'm sure you just like to watch the art of MMA. I love the art of MMA. I love MMA because these guys have several different ways of fighting that they use. So we masters of one, they good at many. And to see them be good at many and put it all together is a beautiful thing. Listen, have a great time tonight. I'm going to hand back to the team in the studio. When you talk about when you talk about royalty and boxing royalty, the former super middleweight champion, former light heavyweight world champion, in this very building, and I talked about the Olympics, the Beatles, and things like that in here. Marvin Hagler, who we lost this year, one of the greatest of all time. He his middleweight title win that started his seven-year run over Alan Minter, right here in this building. Right here in this building, and you take a look at some of the people that have fought here. Yeah. That man right there across the was just interviewed one of the oh. best boxers of all time. And now ready to make his way to the cage, Davy Lehnhorn Gallon. It was Scandinavian Vikings that first took Normandy. They were called the Conquerors, the hometown of Navy Gallon, who was called Le Normand as a result. And it is not a coincidence, John, that we are seeing more and more fighters from France over the last couple of years. Now that it was finally legalized, now that guys can train at home, and it's gonna, France is gonna be behind the other countries, obviously, but now, even in the last three or four years, you can feel the difference. You feel the difference. Let's just take a look at some of the people that are coming out of France and what they're doing. I mean, Cyril Gaon is one. We just had, you know, Fabakari yep. Jada, and look at the performance he had. And I will tell you, look, Davy Gaon, he had one of the most impressive knockouts I've ever seen when he beat Ross Pearson by what we call a rolling thunder kick. It was the, the knockout of the year. And now set to make his way to the cage, Kane, the Danger Musa. Life truly is what happens when you're busy making other plans. And a troubled childhood caught up to Kane Musa later in life. He was on a roll. He had won two straight. His MMA career was coming together when a previous incident finally caught up with him. He was charged with felony assault possession. He served four and a half years. Think about losing the prime of your career in your 20s. Four and a half years in prison. But he turned his life around. He made his promises to himself, to his family. And when he got out, he has sort of picked up where he left off. And he's had a pretty impressive start here in Bellator. He is an outstanding striker. Very technical, very powerful. He is so good on his feet. My, my only thing, and I've talked to him about this, is you got to let it go. He's so good that at times he holds back because he doesn't want to make a mistake. Sometimes you just got to let it go. That's how Kane Musa wins this fight tonight. Back to 155 we go for the tail of the tape. Tail of the tape, real simple. You can see these guys match up right across the board. There's really not much of a difference at 68 inch to 68.5 inch reach. Kane Musa is the guy who wants to keep this on the feet. And for the most part, Gallion's going to want to get him to the ground. Bellator 267 prelims tonight live here in the UK on BBC iPlayer now presents three five minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot eight, weighing in 155.1 pounds. Making his Bellator debut, he enters with 18 professional victories, seven losses, two draws, fighting out of Normandy, France, Davy Gallon. 
and across the cage his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eight weighing in 155.2 pounds for him it's fight number four inside the bellator cage as he brings a professional record including 13 wins three defeats fighting out of manchester england kane the danger Couldn't help but notice the crowd seemed to take sides when they announced where they were each from. I wonder why. I... First round. 155 is an interesting conversation right now because Patricio Pitbull is still the champion and the number one contender is his brother who will fight Peter Queeley coming up in Dublin. We've got Ben Henderson and the former world champion Brett Primus coming up in Phoenix. So what happens next at the top of 155 is fascinating. There's going to be a lot of movement yeah, in the fives coming up. That's the beauty of the next month here. Very nice change of levels with the body shot by Kay Musa there. Musa's got power in both hands. He just needs to let them go. And many times he'll hold back and he won't throw. And he'll walk forward. He won't be offensive. He's like, I've got to be offensive if we want to get this win. Talk about he's just got power, man. The guy is strong. You can almost hear the corner and cheer, encouraging him to go forward, which is exactly yep. what they should be doing because when he goes forward and he's active, he is hard to stop. Guys just don't get a rest, they don't find that area where they can attack him, and he is devastating with his power. He just needs to be offensive. Nice little check hook by going. Again, going to the body. Those body shots by Musa, they will add up quickly. Short counter right here at the corner. Imploring, use those hands. Use those hands. Jab. Got yeah, Mom moved into the left jab of Musa. Crowd has made its choice. Right there, that little exchange you saw where they both missed it was because both of them took their heads off the center line where both of those shots were going. That's why you, we talk about he's got to get his head off the center line. If neither guy had pulled their head off of that, they would have got hit and could possibly have been hurt. The hand movement, and there is a lot of Busa, it comes across as defensive and not fainting. Well, and you'll notice in the, probably in the last 45 seconds or so, Kane Musa has become, instead of offensive, become much more defensive, not throwing as much. Now he's giving his opponent, Guyan, the, the ability to actually take this round. So many great fights coming up over the next month. I think Ben Henderson, Brent Primus one is getting lost a little bit. Sort of an interesting clash of. Well, oh, absolutely. Great clash styles. of styles. Yeah. What they both do. This is where Guyon is very strong. He's got a great judo background. You'll see him. He will utilize overhooks more than you'll want to see from a lot of fighters because he's good with his throws from that position. ability to step through that by Kane Musa. Really, for 
own. Impossible to get a trip from that position. It's always interesting to me how some fighters say they absolutely hear everything the crowd says, and some fighters are completely oblivious. Everybody is different. Jones tried three times now for that jump knee. But at least he's going, at least yeah. he's being offensive. That's what he needs to do. Judges have not had to be very busy. Ooh, that Ooh, was a good shot. Very nice around. shot. A strong finish to round one for David Gallion. Wow. I believe and that. You see the damage. That was that shot with about five seconds to go in the yep. That cut came from an elbow right at the end of the round. Normally, when you get something of that type, it's bone to bone. That's a big cut on K Musa. Yo, that is big trouble. I think we just passed. That elbow you just saw thrown by Davey. Yeah. Beautiful hip toss at the end, but it was this elbow That's right it. there. That's what left the gash on Kane Moose's forehead. Is he allowed to go out like that with that much? That's an awful lot of Vaseline. That's, that the, whole, that's the whole tongue. The fight. Yeah. What are the rules governing that as much how much you're allowed to have? Well, it's supposed to be that, you know, no excess is what they're going to say. That's excess. Yeah. But it's, it's real tough when you're, when you're the cut man, you know, I want to glob it on there because I want to keep, I see how deep it is and it's a bad cut. Well, isn't it and really? right there, just you saw, yeah. Davey Gaillon just threw a shot and it actually just skimmed it, but it just swept, all that Vaseline kind of swept down towards King Moose's eye. Isn't this on the it's not on the cut man. The cut man's job is to stop the cut no matter what. No, that's on the referee. But all that Vaseline right now is being smeared onto yep. Gaillon, and it can become a problem in the fight. Big difference when we're talking MMA compared to boxing and the use of Vaseline. And you can tell just by looking at Gaillon how much the cut has opened up here, Abusa, uh, early in round two. I believe really needs to start to have a sense of urgency when you see him pawing at yep, that yep. trying to wipe the blood away It's telling you he's having a little bit of problem with his vision That's when a referee will start to come in stop the action and bring a doctor in to assess He doesn't you can see Mike Belcher and his eyes are squarely focused on that cut That's the lead side, so that's the eye You're depending on Nice clean body shot by Musa Tough to see these shots coming. You see Moose. Moose has now taken much bigger shots here in round two. You can see that he's actually trying to switch stance into yeah. a southpaw to try to bring his head so that cut is to the back side. Those kind of little clashes right there do not help that cut in any way. I think it was a legendary trainer, Mickey Goldmill, who had Rocky switch stances in the second fight because of protecting the eye. It's as popular now as it was then. You can definitely get to a position where you know, just the change in your stance can help you make it through a fight that naturally, if you stay with what you are comfortable in, you're not going to make it through. So Kane's being smart right now. That's part of the reason he's in this clinch is to slow the fight down and keep that cut from being damaged. with 
Both double underhooks. Just controlling position. You're seeing him utilize his head to kind of steer Gayon where he wants him to be. Nice job by David Gayon to switch the position. Good heavy knee inside. Very slippery. Hard to hold on to right now. The psychological effect of seeing yourself like that, being in that situation, how it cannot affect the way you're fighting it seems impossible. The real problem for Moose is it's affecting the way he sees. Yep. And when you get blood in your eye, it's kind of sticky and it leaves a film so you just don't see clearly. And that's why you'll see a pawing that you're trying to clear your vision out. Not an easy thing to do. by Gallion for the trip and doing work at the belt. That's going to be an interesting round of call. I think overall you got, you got to look at everything that happened. It was a nice toss at the end. The step over by Gallion, but yeah. got to say, Musa was the one that yeah. was landing more little shots, not big ones, controlling the position. Wow. Yeah, that's a good one. That is very reminiscent of a man named Marvin Eastman against Vitor Belfort. Fans are seeing it on the big screen. That was the gas when you just heard. And this discussion's going to go on here. Apparently, they got another two. <laughs> what they're trying to do is they're trying to let the cut man work on the cut because what you see at the beginning of the break is not what you're going to see at the end of the break. Let yeah. the cut man work on it. Let's see how good it can get to see if we can allow the fighter to continue on. The real question is how much blood is going in his eyes right now? The international sign thumbs up says we're still going looking good. This fight is taking on a life of its own. That nasty cut over the eye of Kate Luson flicking right at the end of round one. Oh, he got hurt by the ear. Wobbles him. That shot definitely hurt Musa. Galeon goes anytime he senses even any kind of advantage, he goes for that jump knee. Musa again getting those double underhooks right now. But you've seen that Gallon has been able to, with overhooks, take him down several times. So it's not a position that he's uncomfortable with. Didn't take long for the cut to reassert itself. Yeah. Big chance. Gallon has taken them, none bigger than that one. He's in on that guillotine, guillotine. right now. He, you can tell he didn't like the way it felt. No, and he's also not wanting to just blow out his arms for something that he's not yeah. sure that he's going to be able to finish. Oh, nice. Nice job of trying to chain those techniques together. Just wasn't enough space for him to get it done. Really starting to tax that gas tank right now. 
this right here, when you're looking at this, a lot of people look at this, oh, they're just holding each other. No, this is exhausting. Yep. Those nice little shots inside. Nice quick elbow by Musa. Beautiful knee by Gayon. We've already been exchanging for 12 minutes. Long defense, middle of the cage, spinning elbow. And on top of it, this one really turned into something for Musa. After suffering that cut, he comes on strong. And it's Gallion who has to slow it down. The fights take on a life of their own, and suddenly this would be even more impressive a win for Kane Musa than it would have been at the start. Yeah, if he's able to, if he's able to fight through this and pull this fight out. I think there's a lot of adversity just fighting through that cut. Yeah. That, that is not a little cut. The blood getting in his eyes. And then just the way these guys have been. Oh, nice elbow attack by KO. Set it up with a little shoulder strike. See Musa, if, if you're going to have this double unders, either bring them high, that's going to take away the ability for the overhooks of Bayon to work, or bring them down low and try to suck his hips in. We have had two fights so far, another jumpy attempt. None of these have landed. Go to the cards, and neither one was close. This one is going to be. This uppercut just missed by Gayon. Jimmy Gallon's gone for that wild fight ending YouTube stuff. Like I said, he had his last fight was against Ross Pearson where yep, he, he pulled up. No, if anybody knows where Rolling Thunder, that means he was spinning on his back onto the floor and landed a heel to the head of Ross Pearson and put him unconscious. That's been his go-to. He is an outside trip. He do almost a judo throw, and that's his background. Nice right hand by Musa. Nice response yep. by David Gayon. Musa pushes him back to the fence. He's it was going for it. That one looked like the one in minute 15 looks a little sloppier than the one, say, in minute seven. Just a little. Can't blame him for that. Right here, K. Musa needs to say, you know what, I need this. I need to impress. I need to posture. I need to throw everything I can at this guy right now. Leave an impression. Two evenly matched veteran lightweights to begin, but a fight that took on a life of its own. But Musa suffered that nasty cut. Over his left eye late in round one, and he's fought 10 full minutes with it. Great fight by both. It really was. Really good stuff. And good job from the corners. Doctors, Mike Beltran, for getting these guys through this fight. Yeah, you're right. Everybody involved in that. You know, this is trying to get the fighter to fight. If he can fight, here's that elbow that started that giant cut. You can see how hard that thing hit. That was solid, beautiful job by Gayon. Musa did not let it affect him in the fight. Kept coming. That big shot right there. That's the one that hurt Musa. He had a chance at that point. Musa covers up, gets the clinch, finds his way through it. There comes that rolling thunder kick. Wasn't able to get it landed, but beautiful spinning elbow attack. David Gallon opened up with a lot of different techniques in trying to get at Kane Musa. And he opened fight. him up as well. Yes, he did. Wow, great fight. As we said, it has not been a difficult night for the judges until now. Will they be influenced by the damage? Will they be impressed by how Kane Musa fought Yo, through hey, it? Hey, 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 hey. There are different ways to show respect, and these two have earned it.
A fight that could clearly go either way. The only one that knows is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Mike Murtha, scores the fight 29 to 28, while judges Doug Crosby and Eric Colon both see it the same 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Davy Lenormand Gallon. Not nearly as close as we thought it would be. Davy Gallon. The veteran getting his first opportunity on this big stage. Does the damage, records the win, and among his many rewards, a conversation with John McCarthy. <laughs> I'm here with your winner, David Gallon. You fought an absolute beautiful fight against an incredibly tough guy in K. Musa. You opened him up with a elbow near the end of the first round. How how did you when you looked at that did you think they might stop that fight? Oh yeah. At that time I think oh shit it was a pretty pretty nice cut. And I say I tried to punch him because he was always uh, on the cage size and tried to put me against the fence. So I tried to punch 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 to stop the fight. And uh, Musa he did a hell of a job to didn't stop the fight. And it was an honor. And I think the fan love that Musa didn't want to stop tonight and can continue to do a hell of a fight tonight. You used your judo with overhooks many times. You got him down a couple times. Weren't able to keep him down. Yep. How tired were you? Because you were both putting out a ton of energy near the end of this fight. Yeah, I love judo. I came from judo. I do judo since I, I was five years old. And uh, Musa do a lot of wrestling, you know? and didn't pay attention sometime to his leg. So I say, let's go, it's the time. It was only technical takedown, because at the end of the fight, I was a little gas out, man, a big ass, big gas out. So Tell that's why good. I didn't keep it on the ground. The cut. And it was so tough to get up, you know? It was like he touched the ground and boom, he bounced again. <laughs> yeah. I say, what? <laughs> Multiple times you tried a lot of knees. You tried your rolling thunder kick, which you had gotten a knockout with. Yeah. What were you thinking as far as how tough he was? Oh, you know, uh, I didn't, uh, I never underestimate an opponent. And I know uh, Musa was very, very tough. But sometimes he gets his head down to put big hooks. I say it's the time to put the knee. And uh, for the rolling thunder kick, that's something I love to do because fighting for me, it's a pleasure, you know, it's a game. So I say, like in, the, like in the game, you know, video games, say, I go try the rinse and the kick, like it was a special finish him, like in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that was a beautiful performance. Congratulations on your debut here in Bellator. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Davy Gallon. Yeah, he was playing with that joystick a couple of times trying to hit that big Mortal Kombat shot, but David Guyon records a win in a fight that really took on a different direction. Josh, you have been in some of the great battles in the history of this sport. How does a cut like that, so dramatic, how can that change how a fight is going, going forward with it? There's a lot of different ways of looking at it. A cut of that size, of that magnitude, once you get in between rounds and you look up at the prompter and you see how big it is, mentally, it wears on you. And then not only that, but then when you start fighting, the blood gets into your eyes, gets into your mouth. It becomes a red haze. You don't see the shots that you would normally see. There's a lot of things that was going through his mind during that fight. And I gotta tell you, the fact that he got into that second and that third round is still put on a heck of a performance. I tip my hat to K. Musa. Given how soon it was the end of round one that that cut opened up, as some people were remarking, the size of, and the width of the River Thames, to carry on and to really put it in there in front of his home crowd tonight, he'll be desperately disappointed uh, with the result and with the judges' scorecards. I had a 29-28. You know, you can flip it any way you want, but I had a 29-28 going to Gaon. But the thing is this, is that in between rounds, the cut man did a wonderful job because you can listen to any boxer. Roy Jones Jr. is down here. Ask him. A cut man can make or break your career. So making sure that a lot of a lot of fighters, a lot of top fighters, will stick with a cut man for their whole career, knowing that he's a good one. And so in that situation, he got very lucky that in the second round that he was able to stop the bleeding. It kind of opened back up as it does normally, but in into the third round, he was able to stop it as well. 
It was very well, it was very well taken care of by the cut man. Good job. Is that a fight we'd like to run back? Oh my god! That's not my call. Okay. Don't, don't put me on the spot like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will be running back later on our main event, which is live on Showtime 4 Eastern, 1 o'clock Pacific. It is the most highly anticipated rematch in Bellator welterweight history as Douglas Lima, the phenom, takes on Michael Venom Page. And before we bring you our final prelim tonight, we have more time to talk about that. Earlier on, you graded Michael Venom Page with an A for fighter IQ. Let's parse that somewhat, Josh, as we look at his knockouts. What are all the ingredients that could go in to make these devastating KO finishes? Well, what he uses, he uses his length and his speed. Without saying tall, long, and lanky, he uses his length and his speed to his advantage. What he does, he waits for them to make the first step. And as soon as they go to, to throw their punches or their kicks, see, they lunge in. He either takes a step back or he beats you to the punch by stepping in with his length and his speed. His accuracy is on point. Derek Anderson was having fits with him throughout the whole fight. He goes to step in, boom, he threw the head kick right up to the face. Derek Anderson is someone who's like one of those bulldogs, will chase you down, get into firefights. He is a dog when it comes to fighting. I like to say that because he's one of those type of fighters. MVP made him look silly when he was out there. There was nothing, he couldn't touch him, he couldn't reach him. There, he, he knew that MVP was outside of his box in the range of fighting. That's why I gave MVP an A in terms of his fight IQ. And maybe that will go to A+, plus. that will that remain to be seen. And what about the speed, Josh? So the speed is, it's there. The speed, the reach, and, but the thing is, it's the timing of it all. So the speed, sure, and the reach, sure. But if the timing is off, he can he can still hit you going backwards. If you lunge in, he'll take a half step back and he'll hit you, boom. Or if you're a little slower than him, he knows it. He'll take that half step in. Like he was saying with Douglas Lima, the first fight. He's like, I made my adjustment after I rocked Lima. I stepped in six more inches. That six inches cost me. He's like, I got my legs swept out, and then I didn't get up properly, and it cost me the fight. He's gonna be a little bit more cautious tonight, but with other fighters that don't have those devastating leg kicks, that was the game changer in that fight, but in most other fighters, they don't have that game changer. So when it came down to it, his speed and his ability to get in and out faster than other fighters was there, is there still. And that's what makes him so good. All right, well, if MB MVP has had to make adjustments uh, for this fight tonight, has Douglas Lima, given the fact he won the first fight and he won it in such devastating fashion? He says he's not going to change anything, and he hasn't normally changed anything in any of his past losses. He's fought a little bit smarter here and there. Here's the thing with Douglas Lima, is that he can get this fight to the ground if he wants. He's got great submissions if he wants. When he is on top, he's got nasty, vicious ground and pound. And we know what he can do on the feet. He's got highlight reel knockouts. You see right here with Douglas, or with MVP. He hits the leg with the leg kick at the calf. MVP goes down, doesn't get up properly, boom, touches him on the chin, lights out. Here's with Roy McDonald. He's touching him, boom, leg kick. Touches him in the head, boom. He just keeps touching him and touching him. Everything is one, maybe one, two, then leg kick. Everything he does, though, lands with power, mm -hmm. and it's on point. I mean, that's the one, that's one of the things that's hard to teach. The only issue that I think a lot of people, when you're looking at Douglas Lima, that people have with him, is that he never gets beyond gear two. Michael Venom Page hit that nail on the head when we talked to him this week. No matter what I do to him, he'll never come out of gear two. He won't extend himself, he won't try to get to me. MV, uh, Lima needs to get out of gear two, three, and maybe into gear four if he plans on winning this fight. Indeed, because this is not over five rounds tonight, it will be over three rounds. Now, for more on our main event, let's go cage side to Jenna Kwachi, who's with Gareth A. Davies. Thank you so much, Aiden. And yes, Gareth, we're down here. We are on the floor. It is starting to heave here in Wembley Arena. How much will the atmosphere and the occasion get to Michael Venom Page? What an atmosphere. And a lot of that is about Michael Venom Page. Four times he's fought in London. He's undefeated here. But of course, he lost to Douglas Lima two and a half years ago. This is a massive moment. The crowd will get behind him enormously. Do you know, he told me this week he's worked on 10 different ways. Of, that he can finish Douglas Lima. That's a massive statement. Lima's so dangerous. Just one mistake could win it for either man tonight. There is so much at stake. It's repeat or revenge, isn't it? Absolutely, and I can imagine that Michael Venom Page has had this on his mind for the last two years, all the fights leading up to this particular point, but this one means the most, doesn't it? Absolutely it does. He's gone 5-0 and since he was defeated by Douglas Lima. Look, 
The belt's not on the line. This is for the championship of each other, if you like. They are both brilliant elite fighters. I just hope at the end of the fight, if it goes three rounds, would we have wanted it to go five rounds? Both are saying they're going to get a knockout. It's going to be an amazing fight. And this sets up something really tasty, potentially for a shot at that world title. Absolutely, against Yaroslav Amazov. Lima wants it, so does Paige. So the winner takes all. The winner takes it all indeed. But we're looking here tonight. Listen, the occasion, the atmosphere. What is it going to be for Michael Ben and Paige to maybe keep his cool in that cage tonight? Look, mentally he's really strong. He said he lost loads of fights as a freestyle world kickboxing champion. He was regularly losing fights. He said his loss was a learn and the fact he made one mistake and he rushed in when he had Lima in trouble last time. I think it'll be a really cagey fight to start. But I think, mentally, I think he's got Lima's number this week. And Lima, of course, makes a massive weight cut. So, but he's dangerous. He's always dangerous, Lima. But I think Paige is the guy with momentum. OK, well, it's all to play for down here. We're right by the cage. And we'll hand it back to you guys in the studio. All right, Jeanette. And here's the thing. You know, when it comes to this fight, this is more the welterweight title is not held by either guy, but the welterweight division. The key to it is this fight tonight in which direction it goes. And let's face it, a win for MVP tonight. He's right alongside AJ McKee on the Bellator poster, if you will. Oh, if you're talking about superstar potential, the guy that can get people's emotions going, their attention and wanting to see him. Michael Venom Page has got it all. And now ready to make his way to the cage, Michael Bad Boy Dubois. We just saw Davy Gaillon come up with the win, and we talked about fighters from France and how that has changed. Michael Dubois is one of the fighters who wanted to pursue this career, so he left his home country and went to Switzerland because a lot of young fighters, 16, 17, 18 years old, when they first start, first get this idea, if you were in France 10 years ago, you're thinking, I, I can't be here, I have to go somewhere else, and Michael Dubois is one of the guys that did. Boy, it's so hard when you, you live in a country that at the time, it's illegal. You can't even perform the sport that you are part of in your own country. That makes it tough, and it makes guys like Michael Dubois go to a different country to not only be able to participate, but to be able to learn from guys at a different level. And that's what you're looking at as a smart fighter to say, okay, if this is what I'm gonna make my career at, I gotta go with the best. If Josh keeps trying to do that French accent, they may ban him again. <laughs> the SSE Arena Wembley here in London. The time has come to conclude the Bellator 267 prelims as we go three five-minute rounds in the welterweight 
division. Introducing the blue corner at 5 foot 10, weighing in 170.2 pounds. In his Bellator debut, he stands with 11 professional victories, seven losses from Geneva, Switzerland, Michael Bad Boy Chukwa. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5 foot 10, weighing in 169.8 pounds as a professional. 18 victories, six defeats from Ronda Kalantaf, Wales, presenting Lewis the Foot Long. In charge, referee Jaron Vallel. Six hundred and fifty-six days away from Michael Dubois. You can see why he was a little anxious to get started. Now while to keep that welterweight oh, big shot big right shot. away by Lewis Long. Now this is starting off bad for Michael Dubois. There goes Lewis yeah. Long right to the back. This is big early trouble. Big early trouble. Lewis Long straightens him out. He's palm to palm on that. That is tight. He's going to switch it. Full lock. He's going to go out. He's out. He's out. We're done. A spectacular performance by Lewis Long. We talked about it earlier. The one plays that Michael Dubois definitely did not want to be is on the ground with Lewis Long on top of him. That is exactly where he ended up after eating that shot. Maybe she changed his nickname to Minnick. <laughs> you could, you know, Michael Dubois was so, he was obviously so excited to fight. You can be too excited and you're going to make mistakes that way. Well, look at the, this is almost the whole fight right here. Here's the shot. Look at that right hand. It stuns him, then the left touches him too. You see him stepping back a little bit. Loose on that leg, that shot. Left hand actually missed, but it was all all the right hand. You can see it just had that snap. And as soon as he went back, Lewis Long knew that he had him in trouble. Then when he got him to the ground, he went palm to palm. He was almost out and then went all the way to a full lock. And you can see it actually tore his glove. He did. His glove got split. Third Bellator win for Lewis Long. Okay, bring it in, guys. Bring it in. Another name to consider on a very long list at welterweight. It didn't take long for Lewis Long. Michael C. Williams will make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage with a rear naked choke in tight it comes to an end. 41 seconds into round number one. The winner by technical su submission, Lewis. The full A conversation that figures to be longer than the fight was. Lewis Long with John McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with your winner, Lewis Long. Lewis, that was fast, that was nasty, and you put him to sleep. Um, <laughs> what can I say? I, I'm an explosive guy. I got a family on the way, you know? I got a baby, a baby being born in the 23rd of January. I need to earn some money. Get me out of Ireland! Yeah. You hit him with the right hand. In fact, it split your glove somewhere in that whole thing you hit him with the right hand take a look on the screen right here that right hand stung him you saw him lose his balance at this point when you were going after him, you go, did you know how hurt he was um for the last few years we've trained not trying to hit hard i know that sounds stupid you know you load up on your shots and they're the ones that don't land obviously that one's a little bit no loaded <laughs> but i know he jumped into his shots 
So that's how he's trying to patience, patience, patience. Normally I'm the one doing what he did. Normally that's me jumping onto a shot. But I'm finally 32, I'm growing up. I'm <laughs> finally getting a better fight, they're holding my patience. And I, I can hit hard with everything. You know, ask the missus when I hit you with the hips. Oh yeah, there'll be more babies on the way. Yeah! You first put on a palm-to-palm -palm on that choke and then switched it into a full lock. Why? Because um, in fairness to him, he did go to the hand and uh, I was unsure with the glove. Uh, so I thought I'd slip it through because, well, I could. And, you know, once it's locked, it's locked. The pound-to-palm could still be broken. But once I, you know, once I got that behind his head, once I was sure I could get that behind his head, you know, I thought, sod it, I'm here anyway. I'll have a double. Yeah, you had a double. That was fast. It was nasty. Congratulations on a big win. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Lewis, the foot long. 16 consecutive Lewis long fights have been finished. 12 of them in favor of that guy who does it tonight in 41 seconds. Guys, seven prelim fights tonight, four first round finishes. Bodes well for what's coming up at the top of the hour. You bet it does. Thanks, Sean. It really whets the appetite. And what a way to bookend our prelims tonight with a signature career win for Louis Long, the pride of Wales. He's got it. He's going to be a new daddy. Hey, Josh, uh, how easy, how hard is it to split a four ounce glove punching someone in the face? I don't know. I don't have that kind of power. I never have. So that's, I wouldn't know. But no, look, honestly, I've called several of his fights. He's a great fighter. He's intense. He's aggressive. He's got good wrestling. And like you saw right there, his transition was seamless from the takedown to the back, right to the choke, went palm to palm, couldn't get it, went right behind the head, tucked it in, fight was done. That was seamless the way he did his transitions. Great job tonight by Lewis Long. It is another name on his CV that includes wins over Ryan Scope, Walter Gahadza, and Giovanni Melillo. So we will see how far Louis Long can go in this stacked 170 division. Yeah, we're going to see. I mean, like, he's already talking about Ireland. He's trying to get that money before the baby comes, and I understand. <laughs> Five weeks, can he turn it around? Well, he barely broke a sweat tonight. We will see. Right, it is time to look at our main card, which is coming up oh so soon. Bellator 267 is live from Wembley, the SSE Arena, and it is top tonight by a highly anticipated rematch taking center stage we run it back between the top two contenders at 170 the former three to, uh, division champion douglas the phenom lima stepping in once again with the electric and deadly michael venom page we'll also see northern ireland's liam mccourt against jessica borga we have veterans robert whiteford against andrew fisher and an explosive lightweight match to kick it off we will see you at the top of the hour it was an unforgettable KO. Oh, oh, what a shot by Lima! And number one contender Douglas Lima is looking for a repeat. Phenomenal! But number two ranked Michael Venom Page is on a five fight win streak. Page showing off! And hell bent on revenge. Two of Bellator's most dangerous welterweights in a must see high stakes sequel. Wow, what a punch! Bellator MMA, live from London, today at 4 Eastern on Showtime, where warriors rule. It is said that at the center of all great rivalries lies an unwavering desire to win. Where two competing forces put their skills, reputations, and their lives on the line to assert their dominance over one another. This guy might be the best damn welterweight in the entire sport. For former welterweight champion Douglas Lima, his entire legacy 
has been built on defeating his rival. Good shot. Good shot. He's got down. He's in trouble and it's over. One after another. Proving time and time again that he's willing to lay it all on the line. That there are no challenges too tough and no opponent too great. At Bellator 267, Lima will be entering enemy territory to face one of his biggest rivals to date. The human highlight reel, Michael Venom Page. A familiar foe whose reputation for career-ending finishes has marked as one of his most dangerous opponents to date. Michael Venom Page is that rare breed of fighter whose brutal highlight reel knockouts In your face, entertaining style. He is toying with David Rickles like a predator with his prey. Have made even the best opponents look average. Oh, 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 Who has a fight, you know? How I do things with ease. I think now he just become a can, but not because he's not an amazing fighter. It's because of how I make people look when I'm in there. But I'm just on a mission for one person, and that's Douglas Lima. And while his only loss came at the hands of Lima almost two and a half years ago, it's that rematch that he's been chasing ever since. I believe that wholeheartedly. I believe I've, I've deserved it. I've been very active. And I think it's a great story as well. You know, it's my only loss. On October 1st, one of Bellator's biggest rivalries will take center stage at the iconic Wembley Arena, when Douglas Lima looks to put an emphatic end to his rivalry with Michael Venom Page. I genuinely don't believe he wants to, to fight me. A rematch two and a half years in the making. Whenever he's ready, I'm here, you know. He knows where to find me. The road to the welterweight title travels through London. He's saying I was scared. We're gonna see him now. This is Countdown. Douglas Lima versus Michael Venom Page. Two. Former welterweight champion Douglas Lima is the embodiment of longevity at the highest level in the sport. We're good. We're here. We got work to do. He's fought his way through three Bellator World Grand Prix and come out the victor each and every time. He's held the welterweight belt longer than any man in Bellator history. A steamroller-like performance by that man, Douglas Lima, as he captures Bellator's welterweight world championship. And has proven that he's up for the toughest challenges just as much now as when his journey first began. Honestly, I have no idea which one these are, <laughs> but they're pretty worn now, so it's probably one of the, one of the old ones. When I first got signed with Bellator, it was the hundred thousand dollars. He gave me that offer. You know, there's this tournament, hundred grand if you win three fights. And you know, it was every four weeks you fight. You know, like man, this is quick. <laughs> oh, right hand! That's it. That is it. I had faith, and I believed in myself. I knew I was gonna win that thing. You know, I saw the guys that was in. And I was like, man, I can't win this tournament. And the tournament champion, Douglas Lima. And then I went to the second tournament, won. Won that second tournament, won the belt after, won the belt for the third time, but I just lost it, and now I'm on the road to get it back. All right, first minute, Dick Dow get up. One minute offense, one minute defense. He's pretty simple. Everybody understand my English? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, center wall, wall center. Either. Nice, nice wheel. Go! Go in on bottom. Go in double bottom. Yes, sir. You saw it with the hook. You know, it's 17 years doing this, you know what I mean? 17 years. Still being here after 17 years, fighting this, you know, top level guys, that's already a win for me, you know, but. Shoot, yes. I want to pace, guys. I want to pace. Keep going. You know, I got another dangerous guy ahead of me again, you know, a guy that's hungry, you know, to get that win back. and. You know, they told me about this fight. Like, yeah, in London, at his backyard. It's like, man, let's do it. 
Boa, Nor. Boa. Boa. Bora. Boa, 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 boa. Boa. Time. Jogue. I'm just saying, guys. Come on. Tinha um three. One, two, three. Two. Tomorrow, guys, a gente tinha lá na Sparre. Ten thirty. All work is easy work. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know who made that up. <laughs> London, England, the home of Bellator's most electrifying star, Michael Venom Page. London! And the future site of his long-awaited rematch. The one and only MVP is back! For MVP, every time he steps inside the cage, it's never enough to simply secure the victory. It's about doing the impossible. I'm a showman when I'm in a cage. I've never cared about the glittery stuff. <sighs> I just enjoy doing what I do. I enjoy entertaining. <laughs> the belt will come with me just constantly beating people. But it's not something I care for. <laughs> I'd prefer to be the person you always know my name. There's been shows that I've been on when all these big names are fighting on it, but after the show, everyone's talking about something that I did. MVP, did you see that kick that he did, or did you see that punch? You know what I mean? I prefer that. Like I said, I'm a showman, so that, that means way more to me than, than a dog. May 11th, 2019. The Bellator Welterweight World Grand Prix semifinal between Douglas Lima and Michael Venom Page. The winner would punch his ticket to the final. We get down to business here in the semifinal matchup in the $1 million Welterweight World Grand Prix five five minute rounds. Backstage before the fight, Lima had been drilling low kicks. As his camp had seen it as a key weapon counteracting MVP's unique style. Kicking has always been my thing, I mean, but I've been doing this on my whole career. And it was just about timing, timing the right moment, you know what I mean? Because he likes to dance around. Michael Venom Page showing off that unorthodox striking. He likes to do all this stuff, and that takes people out of focus. The self-proclaimed snake charmer is going to try to mesmerize and hypnotize Lima, but I don't think a veteran like Lima will, will fall for something like that. It doesn't matter if he dances, if whatever he does in there, I'm going to stay focused on what I got to do. Meanwhile, Lima looking to collect data before collecting that elbow. The takedown is secured by Douglas Lima here in round one. Lima has Paige on his back, working from the close guard. Round two is straight ahead. Second round upon us. Hi, gentlemen. Second round. Red fight. Red fight. Schedule for five. An opportunity to advance to the final of the $1 million welterweight world grand prix. Douglas Lima again. Experience. Showing already, John, in the way he reacts. Although he got momentarily bothered there by Michael Venom Page. Page needs to take advantage right now. Douglas is a, he's not quite at 100%. Oh, and there What a shot Douglas Lima has just defeated Michael I guess the more you train in the gym, all the stuff that you do, you know, it becomes natural in a fight. You, you just do it. Your body just reacts to it. Beautiful kick, but watch the shot right here. That right hand, boom! Touches that chin. Wow. He is unconscious right now. Man, that, that's got to be a top, top two, top three, you know, out of a Douglas's fight. Just how it all happened, you know, it was just so amazing to see that, man. And he, was a great, he was a good one. No words for that one, you know. No words to explain that one. You are absolutely one of the best of Bellator's ever seen. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Douglas Lima. The first bout between Douglas Lima and MVP is all the evidence you need that at this level, 
the tides can turn dramatically and in an instant. For Michael Venom Page, he sees where the mistakes were made and believes he has the adjustments to correct them. As soon as I saw him rocked, I immediately saw the finisher line, and I was like, yeah, OK, it's game over now. And I got a lot more careless. And I ended up sitting a little bit too close to him, which allowed him to get the sweep. Even in the fights he's lost, not much has happened to him. Uh, I don't think anybody's given him any damage in the same way I did. I was, you know, extremely fast and probably the fastest person he's had kind of dealt with. So, yeah, I know I have the ability to do it and finish that job. October 1st will mark nearly two and a half years since their first bout. Everyone has an answer for Andy Pete when they're not in the cage with him. As soon as they get in there, all those answers have changed. And in that time, MVP has been adding clips to the highlight reel. Whose show is it? MVP's right hand all over. He is long levered and lethal. One by one, his opponents fell. He's starting to look like a kid in the school. It's over. It is all over. Just like that. Now riding a five-fight win streak. Oh, 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 oh. Welterweight standout has his sights set on Douglas Lima once more and avenging his only career loss in impressive fashion. I want to be in and out. I'm going to be very direct. I'm going to be very efficient with my work. The only thing that's going to maybe prevent it is if he tries to clinch up and be very defensive, which means it's going to drag me into the second round. But outside of that, he doesn't leave the first round. For Douglas Lima, the road to the rematch has been a rocky one. Suffering back-to-back five-round decision losses to middleweight champ and legend Gegard Mousasi. Once again, the Bellator middleweight world champion. And at the time, 25-0 welterweight challenger Yaroslav Amazon. For Douglas Lima, as we've seen throughout his entire career, it's the highest risk for the highest reward, each and every time out. It's never easy, you know, losing two in a row. But then I look back, it's like, man, I move up a weight class, I fought Musasi. We went five rounds with the guy that's been there with the best. Both things are going to be here. Snatch and pull. Step, pull. Step, pull. Lost from myself, took zero damage. You know what I mean? A guy that's undefeated. You know, I'm fighting in high competition here. Here, I'm disrupting his breathing. He's trying to breathe. I don't want him to breathe properly. <laughs> Better as cardio. You mimic it here. People don't understand it's a lonely sport. You're a ring by yourself. We're here together. But in that ring, lights are on. Now you suck with your own thoughts. If I was going to ask you, why do you pull the trigger? Shut up. <laughs> Simply, just shut up, man. Back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. Walk him down, walk him down, walk him down. Same time, same time. Hold it up, hold it up, hold it up. Go down to one knee. How long is it burning? Everyone's going to get tired. We're not machines. This is the hard part. Who can travel, who can last in the deep waters? We all know that. I'm not here to bad my record. Even if I lose, I want to fight against the best. That's what I am, you know, I'm a fighter, you know, I don't pick fights unless some of these guys do. It's the question of why. Ask yourself that why question. Why am I volunteering to get punched in the face with some money? <laughs> you know, why? Think about that. I'm here to be a champion, you know, and I'm used to being a champion here. 
I'm always looking to the fight that's gonna get me back on top. Yeah. You got problems, you got problems, you got problems. That's it. I can't wait to get this belt back. The long-awaited rematch is finally upon us. On October 1st, familiar foes will face off once again. It's a different game when you step there with me, you know. You know what happened last time. That right hand just touched his chin. Perfect. He's never going to forget that knockout. And that's, I think, what hunts him the most. But Michael Venom Page is ready to exact revenge. Oh, another one-two combination that scores. And has visualized how it will be done. It's just be my... My right hand man. I found him with it before. I just need to find him a few more times so he, he falls over. The score will be settled in MVP's backyard. He is going to get it in London. Make sure you tune in. Two men will enter, daring for greatness. These lights, Bellator, this cage, this is my home. I'll never feel pressure. Let's get it on. Play. Oh, huge left, and it's over just like that. And the Express MVP train. Oh, and what a shot by Neymar! Welcome to our top ten knockouts. Man, that is a fight ender, Sean. Uh, there's one redemption fight I'm looking for. He's constantly got excuses. For me now, I'm not interested in even calling his name. But everyone knows who he is, and we will meet. Or it could just be tired. 35 seconds remaining, round number two. Saunders dropped, oh. Lander could not finish. This yeah, is over. The head kick. That is it! The head kick knockout, and there is the finish for Douglas Lima. Start out with that beautiful body shot to the liver. Outstanding boxing, beautiful combination shot. Thus, hey, that is a 10-8 round. He damaged his opponent. He dominated the action. Anzai didn't land anything in that round. Oh, oh and yeah. again with the flying knee. Look at Anzai. Anzai is a professional fighter that was the Pancras middleweight champion, and he's starting to look like a kid in the school. It's over. It is all over! Just like that! All these different tools to attack. The right hand just starches Anzai. Puts him down, great job of just stopping the action right there by Jason Herzog, understanding how hurt he is, seeing him going down sideways, knowing that that fighter has been disconnected. He is not gonna be able to get back in the fight. Only damage is gonna come. Beautiful performance by Venom. Our power and volume. Guys that hit really hard don't tend to throw that much. That's what we're seeing here from Lima. He's a power puncher. He's just not as busy as Andre Korshkov. You have to look quickly and carefully, but you can tell Korshkov is hurting. As any human being would be. And now big oh, shot. Good shot. It's good enough Korshkov there. is down. He's in trouble, and it's over. It happened. Looks like Korshkov was doing great. Bang! Left hook over the top. Caught Andre Korshkov being a little too aggressive. And look at that. No comparison in the power of Douglas Lima. Gorskov is out cold. Oh, 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 kick by MVP and what a recovery by Anderson. And this fight is over. Just a beautifully executed technique, a nice side kick straight up, brings his leg up. Here comes the foot right into the middle of Derek Anderson's face. So Baker now circling to his left. And they're missing with that jab. Boy, boy. It's a 
good range equalizer. You've got the range disadvantage with the hands. Throwing kicks is a good idea. That's what Lima appears to be doing. Oh, huge right hand by Lima. This is over. And there's the stoppage from referee Jason Herzog. Man. Look at it here. Bang. His head, like a bobblehead, spun him around completely. I like the ref a lot. I've worked them several times. I think sometimes you're just gonna let the fighters do their thing. There's a lot of emotions that build up to fights and make good fights. And they're just in there being showmen. This is the entertainment business. I'm gonna hear, I'm gonna probably, when I get home, hear it from Big John what he thinks. But I'm just gonna say, yeah. Big John will have an opinion about that. Yeah. The speed, the reach, the length, all those things play a factor when you're dealing with MVP, and people don't realize that until you get in there. Boom. Nicely landed right up underneath the chin. Just a stunner. Third game, you can't wait on MVP. He, he's too fast, he's too long, as you're seeing right there. Did measure that right hand beautifully. You gotta demand your respect right off the bat. Otherwise, it is just the MVP show. He can just dominate, and that's exactly what he's doing. It's been the MVP show since he came to Bellator. It's been the MVP show. Him and Jimmy are going to have to fight for the name, the rights. Whose show is it? MVP right hand all over. He is long levered and lethal. Eats and faints again, and now watch. Steps in, beautiful little overhand right. Normally, MVP throws the straight, but he can realize he can come right over the top, land it right on the button. You see Molilo just go straight down, body goes stiff, head hits off the canvas, fight is done. That's, I don't know how many times we've seen walk-offs from MVP. That was a straight-up walk-off. Saw last time, great performance by Chris Lozano against Brent Wheatman, but Brent Wheatman walked into a lot of punches. Didn't seem to want to use his whole toolkit. Seemed to want to walk in and bang, and he can't do that against Chris Lozano. I think Lima's doing the right thing, angling, trying to throw him a lot of looks. Jimmy Lozano was emphatic in telling us, punches and bunches, I need to have a high volume of punches. Very true. Oh, right hand! Tournament championship. Wow. Welcome to our top 10 knockouts in Bellator history. That was a gorgeous right hand. That's how you're supposed to do it. Through the jab Thank and then bang, right on the jaw. Incredibly accurate right cross. That's what's going to get Rudy Bears in trouble. He's reaching punches. Has to stay tight, find his opportunities to get inside. is rolling even faster down the track. It's getting of the end. Look at the timing of that. That is the knockout. Once again, fast, accurate. His opponent never saw it coming. Rudy Bears was trying to move his head out of the way. Too slow. Man, unbelievable. Look at the timing. We'll see it again. This is slow motion, folks, and it still looks fast. Beautiful right hand. Showing already, John, in the way he reacts. Although he got momentarily bothered down by Michael Benham. Page needs to take advantage right now. Douglas is a, he's not quite at 100%. Oh, and there it is. What a shot by Lima. Mamma mia. Douglas Lima has just defeated Michael Venom Page in impressive fashion. What a sequence. What a sport. Beautiful kick. We were talking about that kick but watch the shot right here that right hand boom touches that wow. chin he is unconscious right now didn't even need those two he was out before he touched the ground
What do you lose out of the playbook after taking a big lever shot like that? If you oh, can even stay in the fight. I, I mean, if you, A, it's hard to keep your right hand up. B, it's very hard to move. C, it's hard to breathe. So just about everything you need in a fight, you lose off the lever shot. It can come back. Lunging shot could not have timed it any better by Cyborg Santos. Bang! Beautiful shot. He can't do this. He can't look at Hector Lombard without pumping that jab. Got to do something to keep him away from you. Swing and a miss by Lombard. That's a good right hand. Big punches. That's it. Goodman down and is in all sorts of trouble. And there's the stoppage. Another rapid fire victory for Hector Lombard. Goodman not throwing enough, kind of waiting a little bit. And once his back was against the fence, good right hand set him up. And bang, that right hand, the jaw finished it. Bang, right on the chin. Credit to Whisper Goodman, he didn't go out with that, but another right hand, right on the chin, too much. 19-0, power strikes landed in round one, a wipeout for Melvin Manoff, but here comes Joe Schilling. Eats another left hand. Oh my God! That is it! A one-punch knockout win for Joe Schilling! You'll see it, I believe it was a left hand. Off this clinch right here, he believes he has Schilling hurt, and then bam! Right hook, left hand over the top. Good night, Melvin Manoff. The speed of Joe Schilling, you'll see a right left to finish. And I don't think that left was necessary. I think that right hand put him out. That is world-class kickboxing. Calm under fire. And he gets the knockout win in his Bellator debut. No, I'm not standing. Watch his movements, jump. Kato almost dismissively called Schilling a big glove fighter. He said, I'm a small glove fighter. Oh! 